Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It is I, Rob Armanex, and the ever wonderful legend of Jess. Jess, hello, say hello. I take offense to, to that uh, description. Uh, what do you? The, the, it's literally your username, <laughs> Legend of Jess. What do you want from me? I'm talking about the ever wonderful Taru Dipshit. Oh well, I mean I'm biased, so it's gonna happen. But that's fine. That's fine. Anyway, welcome everybody. This is Jess, the newbie for Persona 5 and the Persona series in general, and the series veteran, the expert, as it were, discussing uh, your thoughts on the game. So, yeah, woo! <laughs> I'm, I'm clapping. all about me. I'm trying to clap into the mic, but no one can hear it. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> Well, I, I heard it, and that's all that matters. Ah, yes, of course, of course. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you for giving me pity. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so uh, I I guess uh, you know what? Let's let's start somewhere simple. Uh, this art we played through it together, right? And we've been doing that for the past couple months. Um, well, it's and okay, it, more than a couple. <laughs> that makes it sound like there's only two or three. No, okay, fine. It's been like five or six, whatever. It's been a couple months. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, so we've been playing through it this year, and uh, we beat the whole thing just a couple days ago. Um, and uh, But this isn't the first time you've played the game, right? So talk a little bit about that. What's up? Yeah, it was... Uh, I forget when Royal release exactly, but I picked uh, it up last year... Uh, I think near ish to its launch. Maybe uh, March, or whatever. March 31st of 2020. Okay, so it might have been right around there or a little after. Uh, mm -hmm. I tried playing it. I got up to a little into the first palace. The problem, well, there was two, really. Uh, I was very focused at the time on Animal Crossing New Horizons, which just came out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it felt a little hard to juggle between that game which demanded all the attention at the time yeah a very complicated jrpg yeah uh, under understandable understandable yeah so i guess persona and <laughs> ran with animal crossing until for several months um the other thing was i was really bad at persona on my own oh <laughs> i did not understand how some of the systems worked uh, I felt like I was doing really badly at the, oh. uh, for how early in the game it was. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so I abandoned it, and then I we came back a year later. And and then we played through it together, and uh, I, I guess to kind of summarize that playthrough, it was mostly you just playing through it while I gave you like tips, tricks, recommendations, and you. Know, I, I guess I helped you optimize stuff like the like the confidant answers, right? Like I I would tell you which number to pick, basically of the answers you were given, right? Like stuff like that to yeah, help you sort of maximize your playtime. <laughs> yeah, it was basically like anything that wasn't uh as clear as it maybe could have been in the game itself. Right. Like with confidants, classroom answers, helping me a lot with the. Uh, uh, Velvet Room activities. Oh, right, uh, like, the whole fusion thing was, like, that's, like, something that went way over your head, right? Yeah, that that took me a while to fully grab because it was just, like, I felt like there were so many things to consider at first. That took me a while to grasp it, I guess. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just other general stuff, like, you should do this, don't do that here there especially more so in combat right because that's the thing is like mechanically most of the persona games at least the modern persona games when, when I, I guess for clarity on this point going forward unless i specify i'm talking about the classic uh persona one uh persona two eternal eternal punishment or innocence in uh just Let's assume I'm talking about the modern games, which is 3 and onward, because those are the only ones with, like, social elements that are, like, 
with the whole gameplay loop of hanging out, going in dungeons, hanging out, going in dungeons, right? Um, with with the modern Persona games, you get a lot of you get a lot of options, right? Like, <laughs> and Persona Five especially, while it makes it very easy for the player to like you know become a little too good at the game, uh, <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> it's very overwhelming for first timers for sure. Yeah, especially at the start where you're not at least for me, I wasn't sure like how valuable each individual activity really is to do. Cause just oh. in the back streets alone, there's there's uh the the uh hitting the ball, the what the fuck it's called. Um there's the bathhouse, uh there's the clinic, there's a DVD, uh second hand shop, there's tons of things you can do. And Especially when you expand that to essentially a little later on. I felt like there were so many things you could do. But then you mm -hmm. realize a little, a little later. You really don't need to do... No, not so much that really matters. There's, yeah. there's a few different types of things that matter the most more than anything else. And then little things like the bathhouse are really back up. So there's nothing else, other, nothing else to do. Right. Those are just like extra activities to help with your... You know, your social stats and stuff like that, right? Yeah. It also helps you realize that, like, uh, things like, uh, eating at the diner or poten potentially the movie theater. Several of these activities can do the exact same thing. So, you're doing one or the other, and there's no reason to do the other thing. Right, you're, you're given a lot of different options, and, like... Some have, like, slightly different advantages, like a, a part-time job pays you a little bit, but maybe the social stat doesn't increase as much, whereas a movie, you just pay money and your social stat is a bigger bon- a, uh, you get a bigger bonus out of it, right? So, like, there's, like, very small differences, but you're right. For the most part, it's like, well, what stat do I want to raise? Well, I want to pick this. That's it. <laughs> like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh... But yeah, like, I, I, I guess generally speaking, uh, per Persona 5, especially Royal, even expands on those options, right? Because I, I mentioned this to you during our playthrough, but for the most part, in the vanilla Persona 5, your only real option for raising kindness, like, easily, was uh, taking care of the plant in your in your apartment? The cafe, whatever, where you live, the right? Attic. Yeah, the attic. <laughs> uh, the plant was really your only real means of building up kindness. Whereas in Royal, you have the plant, you can clean the cafe, you have different, mo like, extra movie options, you have books now that are better about it, right? Like, they really made sure, like, okay, you can actually have kindness this time because you actually need it. <laughs> yeah. And this much later in the game, but there's a confidant that also boosts your kindness every time you do it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which is super beneficial. Because I, I know... I, I think that the confidant did the same thing in the original. Uh, but, you know, because it's only the one confidant, it's not, you know, a lot, right? <laughs> like, it's just the <laughs> one, so... Yeah, I can see that. Uh, so... Uh, let, let, let's, uh, I guess let's talk about sort of a little bit of, like, the, uh, well, do you want to go into story, or do you want to go to gameplay, or do you want to, like, combine this all together into one thing, I guess? Uh, maybe we should just, like, start somewhere and see where the conversation goes, you know? Uh, sh sure, sure. So, what, what do you think about the beginning of the story? Let's talk about how... The game opens up with this cool cutscene, you know, Colors Flying High is playing in the background, you got all these characters, flashy lights, and it's epic music, and then the first thing you do is watch a high schooler get the shit beat out of him in an interrogation room, <laughs> and it's like a, you know, like, oh, right, your name, kid, you, you, your actions have consequences, and you have to take responsibility and shit. Uh, like, did, did that set up a mystery for you that were you were like interested in how did you feel about it oh yeah that was great sm mystery not even just like 
like who are these characters but even like once you learn the rules about like the metaverse at least for me i was like so how did all this work what happened <laughs> <laughs> yeah what what led to this teenager getting his shit pushed in by the cops <laughs> yeah it avoids the pitfall a lot of RPGs can fall into, which is you're just like roaming around your village or your town or whatever and doing menial stuff until shit just hits the fan. Mm -hmm. Suddenly starts to get interesting. Right. It's interesting right from the get go. It shows you the basic mechanics of being in a palace. Well, the, the very, very basic parts of it. It mm -hmm. shows you how exciting things can get. Uh, it shows you how, uh, how fun combat can be. You know, it's very, uh, very basic oh. at the at that point. Yo, shell shock with the seven party raid. Let's go, yo. yo. Thank you, shell. I appreciate it, homie. Let's go. Uh, hello everyone. We're we're chatting about Persona Five. We're just talking about early game stuff and how my uh my my girlfriend Jess feels about it. So, you know. Yeah. Uh, anyway, continue, honey. How how are you feeling? Uh, so it's, you'll get to see Joker and his whole team, well, you don't see them, but you hear their voices, mm -hmm. and seeing that they're like a well-oiled machine by this point, uh, and it gives you a great glimpse into the future of this, this very tightly knit group of friends who are basically acting as superheroes, mm -hmm. uh, until things go really south very fast <laughs> and then you're suddenly like what is going on oh god mm -hmm. you're right and and that's and that's the thing right like they do a really good job of like like especially in the beginning part where you know like the very beginning when you're in this like what you know this casino like right the big flashy lights and you're breaking out of there you're a thief you're you know you're on the run from stealing something and there's a moment where you're in like the tutorial fight, right? And you know, uh, Joker's persona, Arsen, comes out, and he's like, you know, just gonna let you know, like, shit's gonna go crazy, and let's hope you can get through it all, you know, like what comes next, you know, <laughs> like, and and then basically the whole game is just playing up to that moment, seeing if you can find the truth of what's actually going on, right? So it's it's a really good like teaser, right? Like like it sets you up with all this flashy shit and you're just like, man, I gotta know how it got there and what's gonna happen next. <laughs> it it shows you how how exciting the spectacle can get with the palaces. Mm -hmm. It shows you how intriguing it tantalizes you with that mystery of the of where the hell the story is gonna go. And just gets you hooked on that combat, on that uh, basic part of the gameplay. So you're excited for, for to get back to that, right? While in the meantime, getting into how the social side of stuff works, right? Because that that's the thing, right? Is they <clears throat> how how do I explain it, right? Uh, they slowly work up to like the social stuff, right? Like, they they mildly introduce the concept of palaces, a little bit of the gameplay, and then when you're about halfway done with the first palace, they open it up, right? They're like, okay, you're, you're like, training wheels are off, kid. Like, have fun. <laughs> like, yeah. It's like they, they know that for a first-time player, the social stuff might be the, less, the least interesting part of the game. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and, that's, and that's not, you know, that's fair. I, you know, that, it's understandable. That's not, me, like, that's not me dogging on Persona or anything. Just, like, coming at it from, like, any other RPG. <laughs> right. Or... It, it, yeah. It, 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 you're right. It's, like, most RPGs, you know, the, the characters just do... You're just going through the story beat by beat, right? And then the characters interact along the way. And Persona has that, sure, but, like, it has all these in-between segments where you're actively hanging out with each other, right? Yeah, the more in Persona, the 
like the combat and the exciting like dungeons and that kind of stuff is much more separated from the the casual part of it, I guess, compared mm-hmm. to like a Dragon Quest or I assume a Final Fantasy and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So it uh it has that interesting balance in that gameplay loop that you gradually get sucked into. Right. They they do a uh, real good job of like with the build up, right? So. I, I guess that leads into let, let's talk about a little bit of the uh, that first like story arc I guess right because Persona Five does something a little different from the previous games where there's an overarching like narrative right like that's certainly never gone but it's a lot of mini arcs that all tie together right so what it, what did you think about the first one uh, Kamoshida's Palace uh, like and and as a heads up. Uh, we we will be talking spoilers, but I do have here to show everyone. Boom! I have a spoiler thing, so you'll see when we're talking about spoilers like that are much heavier in nature, right? So for now, we're 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 early game stuff, so I feel like that's fair game. We're gonna talk about that, right? Um, you might be shocked to find out the first palace you go to is not the ultimate final boss, like so. What? <laughs> Yeah, what? <laughs> Crazy. What? Uh, but anyway, what did you think of the whole kind of, in general, uh, Kamoshida arc? Honestly, even by the end of the game, Kamoshida was one of the best, I would say. Oh, oh really? Interesting, interesting. Okay. Not necessarily because of the palace itself being all that wild, because it's, it's not. It's the first palace. But because it's Kamoshida himself and its connection to uh, Ren and Ryuji and An, it's probably the most personal connection of any of the palace rulers aside from the fifth one. Uh, <laughs> right. Like, it's, it's your PE teacher. You see him every day. Uh, and you're hearing rumors about him sexually assaulting people. It's, it's awful. Mm-hmm. At least, uh, and you can, like, I mean, <laughs> like, going to school, that's a, it's a very, like, really relatable thing. Maybe not the, a teacher being corrupt to that degree, but, like, that's something you can see happening very easily compared to, like, a celebrity, where it's just, oh, you read about it, you know? You well, can that's see a... how, how horrifying it would be for the students. How and that, and, traumatic and that, that would be. And that's the thing, is, like, Kamoshida is kind of a celebrity. In-universe, he's an Olympic athlete. Uh, he, right. So, he was a celebrity, so to speak, right? Uh, obvious, not, not to say Olympic athletes aren't worthy of, like, celebrity status, quote-unquote, but, like, a lot, you don't hear a lot of people talking about them every day, right? But for this random school to say, oh, our gym teacher is a former gold medalist, right, in the Olympics, that's like a huge deal, right? So he, you know, the school gives yeah. him special treatment, so to speak. They overlook those things, you know, him it being inappropriate with students and totally being a dickhead and uh, physically harming some of the players as well, right? Um, and... Uh, it's it's really it, it, I agree with you in that it's like honestly one of the more personal arcs because a majority of your party uh, l- at this point it's Ren on and Ryuji uh, and then Morgana not as much but those three before have a very personal connection to Kamoshida right whereas yeah. whereas most of the party uh, whereas, is only yeah. tangentially related to the later ones right. Yeah, if there's a connection to a later one, it's probably just one of them, maybe two of them. Right. Otherwise, right. it's tangential. Mm hmm. Compared to Kamoshi, where, you know, they all go to this specific school where he is the PE teacher at, and he is awful. <laughs> Very they're much. All, they're all essentially victims or friends of victims of him. Mm-hmm. So it was a very, very first-hand experience with how bad this guy is. Yeah, Kamoshida is definitely, like, 
it's it's really relatable because there are a lot of teachers that not not a lot I shouldn't say that but there are teachers who do this kind of stuff right so I'm sure it hit home for a lot of people I'm sure she hoes whole thing uh, you know her whole story is very relatable for a lot of people right like it's oh yeah that like that moment of her jumping uh, was horrifying. Uh, mm. especially compared to the very next arc. Uh, it gives you a very good look at how awful this per uh, the ruler is and his influence on his victims to do these things to themselves. Mm -hmm. And just how, how bad of an, ex of an, of, uh, the influence it is that leads to things like her jumping. And right. It's that like a very a thing, real thing. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, if you do Honest Confidant, that uh, Shiho jumping isn't just forgotten. It's, car it's carried out and mentioned through the game. Exactly. Even in the third semester. Which is great. <laughs> yeah, they like, they actually bring it back up a couple times. You know, assuming you do Honest Confidant, right? Uh, yeah. And, and there's a couple, like, one or two times they mention it in the story, but, like, mostly Ahn's confidant, she brings up Shiho all the time. Like, and, yeah. and how much she, you know, on Ahn's whole story, right, was really, like, wanting to be there for her best friend, right? Like, she should have been there more, right? Uh, she, yeah, her feeling extremely guilty for not doing something sooner. Mm -hmm. knowing how bad how bad things were right and that and that's like super relatable like i you know i'm yeah. i try to be someone who's always there for his friends but like you know sometimes i'm just not there enough or at least it feels like i'm not you know like uh and, and it's you know it's it's a real that's a, like a real vibe you know like i i understand it's very relatable yeah and the same and not the relatable part, but like you also see how how what he's done to Ryuji. Like he was a big part of the track team sometime before the events of the game. Um, I forget to say when exactly that was kaput. Uh but Kamoshio basically killed that, so all the focus was on his volleyball team and getting all that glamour for the school. And that really screwed over Ryuji and the rest of the track team people. Mm -hmm. And the track team and sort also, of blames Ryuji for it, you know? Yeah. Because he's the one that uh, kind of instigated it. In a right. Sense. Right. He he wasn't... He was trying to be like, hey, no, I'm not putting up with your bullshit. And Kamoshida's like, okay. And then, you know, basically ruined his physical body. You know, he beat him and he wasn't able to... Not only is he never able to run again, or at least not to the same way, but the whole track team got just let go, and they sort of blame him for it, you know? Because uh, they're like, oh, why couldn't you just, you know, stay in line like the rest of us, you know? Why'd you have to ruin this? Instead of, you know, blaming what was the ultimate problem, which was Kamoshida, you know? Yeah, it's it's actually kind of sad, like... I'm sure, like, they, I don't remember details, <laughs> all the details, but I'm pretty sure the track team also knew how bad Kawashita was. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, I can imagine the mentality w there was, like, we're also scared of what he'll do. Please spare us. Please don't uh, do anything to what make him attack us. Please, God. So mm -hmm. they're angry at Ryuji for, you know, like, angry the beast. Yeah, exactly. Doing everything for them. Right. And, and you know, that, as fucked up as it is, that, that's another thing that happens sometimes, you know? Like, there, there are people who are just like, oh, go with the flow and just accept things as they are, right? But Ryuji was, was tired of the physical punishment, was tired of being treated like crap, right? And when he finally stood up for himself and the team... It just, you know, it, it ruined everything, you know? 
and 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 that that's what's cool about like he's still a rebel like he still fights back right and that's ultimately what leads to him becoming a phantom thief right is that he's still tired of Kamoshida's bullshit he still he doesn't take that shit lying down right um yeah and as is with the case with all the people who eventually join the fan faves they're fueled by their personal experience uh either with their personal situation or what happened with them with the palace ruler to not let that happen to others mm -hmm. more or less yeah, like we we well, want not on fame. <laughs> right. Like they're fighting to make sure no one has to go through the same kind of stuff that they did, right? Like we'll talk more about it later, but Yusuke's whole thing is, you know, he realized just how corrupt Madarame was and he doesn't want anyone else to go through the same thing anymore, right? He doesn't want anyone else to be blinded and continue this harmful cycle that Monorame had, right? Um, yeah. So, but... <clears throat> anyway, back to the Kamoshida thing, right? Because we can talk... Like I said, we'll talk more about the characters as we keep going, but... Um, I I guess overall, like... The, the Kamoshida arc is, like... Honestly, in, in terms of, like, modern Persona games, is maybe my favorite intro arc because it gives you really it gives you like a good idea about like what th what the game is going to be like here's a corrupt asshole here's the people he hurt go fucking stop that shit you know yeah like that's I'll it's it's really straightforward in how it all plays out like it's a very clear-cut good guy bad guy thing yeah and also like the the like in universe uh consequence for not uh changing their heart by the deadline more or less gets worse and worse the further you go even if a lot of them can probably be boiled down to you'll go to jail <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, but not having else to compare them to being expelled from high school is really fucking bad <laughs> <laughs> especially when it's by from a corrupt teacher <laughs> They and know who's corrupt, and you can do nothing about it. <laughs> right. And th and that's the thing, is, like, it, it's it's a corrupt teacher that not only, like, the player the char and the individual characters fighting him know, everyone knows, and everyone keeps it under wraps, right? Like, the school lets it slide. They know about it. And oh, it's yeah. And it's just, like, you know, failing your deadline... Obviously, you know, because it's a video game, you can rewind a week and you're fine. Yeah, and I'm but, guessing, like, I, I'm guessing they don't actually, like, actually show you're expelled or whatever. It's just, you'll, like, you know, game over screen or whatever, and you re rewind back or something. Yeah, I, th I think you get, like, right? a like a minor, a very minor, like, dialogue sequence, but it's it's not, like, a full story scene or anything. It would be cool if it was, like, a full-out cutscene, but... Yeah. <laughs> Make it a trophy to get all the bad ones. God. <laughs> that'd be rough, dude. <laughs> Not gonna lie, that'd be really rough. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I, I guess, you know, we can... Uh, so, like, mechanically, uh, you mentioned how the, the beginning of the game is kind of overwhelming, right? And... Honestly, that's that's not unheard of for a Persona game, uh, because <laughs> because uh, Personas three and four are the same way, where the beginning of the game you're very limited in your options, right? Like you don't have a lot of different spells, you you don't have you know big damage dealing, attack power, or anything like that. So the game is harder, if only because the player themselves is limited. But by the end game. You you're just summoning gods and destroying everything in like in like two hits. So the enemies might be more powerful, but you're the 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 power creep is like really real in Persona. <laughs> yeah, you'll have you'll have so much money. You can buy any kind of item you want. <laughs> if you don't have like if you don't have a party member that will like uh. That will store a lot of HP to everyone. 
you'll have plenty of items that do the same thing or to up defense for three turns or whatever you want you can get those items <laughs> as long as you have the money which you will get yeah exactly like <laughs> like uh for example uh one of the confidants in the game uh is uh uh Torinosuke, right uh who uh, or as we lovingly call bernie sanders <laughs> <laughs> uh yep. who is basically he he was a washed up politician because he got blamed for money laundering and uh you know he got publicly exiled more or less right like people were just like oh he's no good Toronosuke now like we don't want him right uh but you know as you rank up and learn more about like how he didn't not only did he not do this stuff right but like you you help build his confidence again right like and you you in turn learn from him how to give you know in the universe they say giving better speeches but it's how it's how to you know self-assert right like to to say no i'm not taking your shit anymore and and that ties into the gameplay because you learn better skills for shadow negotiations to get money from shadows now <laughs> and and yeah. the amount of money you can get is unreasonably high <laughs> like uh you can like, get like 23,000 yen from asking a shadow for money once yeah and you can usually get it out of them twice before healing them oh yeah and there's no aside from them saying fuck you i'm gonna attack again there's very little punishment from like messing up messing up you can just keep doing that like asking them twice for money Every battle, you're able to get the takedown, the them all knocked down. Mm -hmm. Get get two rounds of money, them and they kill them all, rinse and repeat. <laughs> yeah, it's it's free money. Like like you said, there's there's times where you can get like up to forty to fifty thousand uh, money, like yen, in just one fight. And yeah, that's and an that's absurd amount of money. <laughs> and granted, yeah. we're talking. Uh, at that point where you're getting that kind of money, that's mid-late game, right? But it doesn't really matter because in the early game, uh, I remember, Jess, a lot, in the early game I was telling you, you know, I know money's kind of tight now, but I'm telling you it's going to get better. And you're like, <laughs> I don't I don't know, like, I barely have 100000 and I buy gear for everyone and now I'm at like 2000 And I'm like, no, 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 trust me, it's going to get better. And then by end game you had fucking five mil. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> money is no object in Persona Five. <laughs> yeah, after a point you get so much money from altering condition mementos. You get uh, from uh, negotiating with shadows, from selling treasure, from selling the sooty shit. You'll have so many resources of getting so many ways of getting money. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Yeah, it is, it is pure comedy how rich and famous this 18-year-old can be. <laughs> you very quickly become part of the 1%. Yeah, you joke, but that's real. That's very real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, but, I, but I guess that's, uh, that's another thing that sort of ties in, right, is uh, combat, right? Like, so what do you think about, like, from beginning to end in your experience, how was the combat of Persona 5 for you? Uh, so, it might have been a little confusing or overwhelming at first, but as it kept going, like, there's, there's all these strategies you, you can do, uh, and especially when you can get their weakness in a baton pass, and if you're able to do a full baton pass, it's just so satisfying you only get into that loop. Mm -hmm. Or even just uh, being in the routine of when you find a new shadow, you test out all your shit on it. <laughs> the <laughs> one is the weakness. And then you go ham on that one. Uh, right. <laughs> but it's just, it's it's very fun going, for, like, obviously every character specify, uh, specifies on, like, one or two uh, types of. Uh, Elemental skills, uh, like Ryuji, uh, 
is electric and physical. Mm -hmm. So if you want any uh, zero damage, you go to Ryuji. Or very big uh, physical damage uh, that isn't for your basic one-two punch, you got Ryuji. Uh, <laughs> he's really good. Um, oh yeah, you had Ryuji for a good chunk of the game, right? Like at least 80% of the game you had him in the party, right? Yeah, he was really good, it felt like, for a lot of the game. Between his his uh, really good physical attacks, uh, having that electric coverage, and his really powerful gun. <laughs> he is really good. But, uh, oh. you know, it's just it's just fun seeing all the things the each individual character specialized in, specialized in and seeing what the best matchup is uh that you personally find having a good mm -hmm. balance of uh like the healing and some elements coverage and probably some physical coverage mm -hmm. just build a way on them with physical skills <laughs> uh, someone with a really good support skill uh and then joker will do literally everything <laughs> you see that's the thing right is uh I mentioned this to you, and you were like, what? Like, this is wild. Baton passing as a base game mechanic was not in vanilla unless you unlocked it for every individual character. And and even then, baton passing didn't have the same benefits that it does in Royal, where if you the more you pass it, you, you did get the power up, right? Like, the attack ups and stuff like that. But you, you didn't get, like... As far as I know, when you got to the fourth player, it wasn't free. I think it's everything costs the same, but like That's overall, right. overall baton passing just sucked in the original. And a downside to having unlocking baton passing in the original, uh, one of the later characters, Haru, completely worthless in the original game because you just couldn't baton pass with her unless you ranked up enough. But you can't do her confidant until you beat the palace she's associated with. So, <laughs> so it it was just this awful thing where like it because there was also no third semester, you only got to use her for a couple palaces, and even then they weren't super long because by that point the rest of your party was beefy as hell. <laughs> like, yeah. And that point, why would you bother having? The super weak worthless character in your party where you have the super buff guy. God, yeah, that it's... sounds awful. I'm so glad I didn't play the vanilla version. <laughs> and that's and that's the thing. When vanilla came out, it was great. Everyone loved it. And you know, there were obviously improvements to be made and we're like, oh, when when are they gonna do the Persona 4 Golden of Persona 5, right? And that was Royal, obviously, but everyone was like, Oh, this game's great. And then Royal came out and we were like, holy shit, we fucked up. This game's so much better now. <laughs> we, yeah, we've made like, a grave I, error. <laughs> yeah, because, like, I can't imagine not wanting to have Haru in the party now. She is so good. She's her, a killer. She's a killer. <laughs> yeah, her gun is very powerful. You only have one shot, but it's very powerful, and it's everyone, which is crazy. Uh, she has... Uh, passive skills to up how much damage her side skills do, and her gun skill, which is already doing severe damage with high <laughs> chance of crit. So if you want high damage, she's like a must-have in your party, it feels like. Oh yeah, for sure. She, she sh she's just insane. <laughs> yeah, like, like it is borderline unfair how, f like, overwhelmingly powerful she is in Royal. And, and that's the thing. They also introduced Showtime, so that's, like, even more damage-dealing options for the player for <laughs> some reason. <laughs> and that's often, like, a get-out-of-chill-free car. If you're in a really bad spot and let's say you have no options, you might suddenly get a Showtime option. And you're like, oh, thank God. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah, and it's basically a freebie. Like, it's, here, attack the entire enemy team and wipe them all out for free. And it's like, great, thanks, video game. <laughs> and get a really cool cutscene during it. <laughs> uh, that's actually a question I have for you. What's your favorite showtime? You could, uh, and, uh, do I need to put up the spoiler tag for this, or? 
I mean, do you consider these spoilers? <laughs> I, I'm just saying, depending on who you answer with, I may have to put up a spoiler tag. Oh, well, uh, you know what? N I don't need to. They're all in the box art. What am I talking about? So, who's your favorite? I got my favorite. Who do you got? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I narrowed down to three, right? Mm. It's Ryuji is in this case, obviously. <laughs> Oh, Ryuji, I'll have the usual. The usual? <laughs> the I, the I fucking love, usual! <laughs> I love the absurdity of it. They're just chilling at a bar eating rice, and suddenly whoever the shadow is, which could be like some grotesque monster, bars on the door, they just open fire on it. It's so good. I'm trying to eat, damn it! <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Ryuji's and Makoto's are, is really good too. The Fist of the North Star thing. Oh, yeah, Fist of the Phantom Star, and she's like, shut up! And like, <laughs> like bonks him. <laughs> and, uh, this is the one you might want to spoil her thing for. Oh, uh, okay, hang on, hang on, hang on. Ba bam Spoilers! Spoilers! Uh, spoilers! Yeah, Jokers, which was great to finally see him being Showtime. And it catches. Uh, oh, yeah. That That's a good insane. one. <laughs> like, the pure bloodlust he has when it's showtime. Oh, it's, yeah. It's it's, it's so good. <laughs> you just see him slash it away mercilessly at the shadow, and then Joker comes in with a single gunshot. <laughs> yeah, because it's, so it's cool. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I can, I can go back away from spoilers now? Uh, yes, in terms of showtimes, yes. Okay, cool. I also just want... So... Maybe we're gonna mention this later, but, uh... So with the time passing... Not only is it so much better now because of... Not being uh, to have to be unlocked through the conference and... Getting a free skill use at the end. But you also have now have darts. That you can oh, use yeah. Game, yeah. Which also introduces another benefit to... Uh, the time pass, which is that, assuming you get, you do that and get up to like the rank three, with every uh party member. Not only do you get those damage boosts and uh, lower SP cost, you also get HP and SP recovery. Mm -hmm. Which is, <laughs> adds a little small like strategic element to using the time pass. So, if you're not doing it to get like a weakness circle going. You can use it to recover uh, people's uh, HP without wasting uh, support skill or item, which mm -hmm. is great. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's it's free. You can like you can heal someone who's not doing great and use that to get uh, boosted damage. It's, uh -huh. it's just so satisfying. And and that's another thing is like this is a very small thing, so I don't want to like talk about it too long but like when they do the baton passes each character has a cute little animation to go with it like when oh, haru yeah. goes for it she like she does like a ooh before like raising her hands it's so cute and then morgana does the he has to like leap up in the air to, to, to do it <laughs> poor little guy he's so tiny why, why is he way down yeah. there <laughs> yeah i love all little animations like that to that add um more to each of the characters. Yeah, it's just, it just gives you like a little bit of a glimpse into their personality because like even though Haru is an unstoppable killing machine, she looks so cute when doing a baton pass. <laughs> like... She's a beauty thief, but she has a fucking axe and she will kill you. <laughs> she she will actually murder you, <laughs> but for real. <laughs> Uh, and I, I guess we can uh, move on in the story, right? So here, let's let's group, let, let's because we're we're already like forty five minutes into this, uh, so you know, and I know we wanted to limit it like to two to three hours, kind of. So let's let's kind of do a little quicker Madarame in what you think of that whole arc. Okay, first off. We can do longer two three hours, but uh... <laughs> what well, we can, I'm just saying, I don't want to have to. 
I don't want to go way too long because I also have to slim this down later in like editing and stuff like that if something pops up, you know. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Madarame was good. Uh, it felt like a major downgrade going from Kamoshida because totally agree. Because you, you hear about all these terrible things he's done, but outside of just Yusuke, you never see directly what he does you hear about someone who committed suicide but unlike Shiho with Kamoshida who attempted to you don't see it you just hear about it like from a, someone like walking up to you and telling you it that's it mm -hmm. so you so you get much less of, a, of an idea of there's much less impact of how awful this uh, palace ruler is as a result Oh yeah, definitely. Like, it's, it's re I I totally agree with you. Like, for the most part, like yeah, Madarame is like kind of a shit ass. Like he sucks, right? But like, you just have to listen to how bad he is. You you're never shown it. It's n and like that's a huge thing for me. Is like, not just telling me storytelling. You know, like, like show me. Like, for example, right, I'm going to pull from a game you've never played. It's Final Fantasy X. Final Fantasy X does a great job with the, I guess, villain of the game uh, because you constantly see the effects of the destruction this villain causes. So, like, it, it just adds that much more to the story, right? And in Kamoshida's arc, you see the results of this. You see... Uh, Mishima constantly being injured. You see Shiho's scene, like you mentioned. Like, you see this stuff, and, like, that only drives you even further on top of the personal connection to the characters that you play as, right? So, it's it's upsetting that Madarame's only real connection to the party, at least, is Yusuke, someone who's kind of a dick to you when you first meet him anyway, so... <laughs> and, and, like, yeah. Yusuke's a good boy. We all love Yusuke, but, like... At the beginning, at least, he's just kind of a creepy asshole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I somehow missed, like, I somehow missed Yusuke being, like, the intro. So I didn't know he was going to join the party. So I thought he was going to be, like, a minor antagonist for that arc. For that whole rest of that arc. Oh, I see. <laughs> how shitty he was. I missed that. It was really interesting seeing him, like, well, fuck, my teacher is an asshole. I'm going to break free from him. Mm. Yeah. Uh, but that does start the thing of like every future uh, palace ruler only having a connection to one party member mm -hmm. as opposed to the whole party up until the consequences stated. Um, and yeah, he's just not as interesting or threatening or intimidating as Kamoshida. His palace is a lot cooler because it's based on a museum, which is really cool. And especially oh, yeah. the especially the later part which where it's all abstract. Oh yeah, the the whole uh, like abstract painting area is really cool. Yeah. But uh as a character and story itself it's it's a major downgrade, I'd say. Yeah, definitely agree with that. Also, can we talk about? I I, I don't have, I don't have a picture to show on screen. Uh, Madarame's crying face when they show it, <laughs> like when they when he admits to his sins or whatever. He's he he looks hilarious. I like I'll, I'll send you a, a picture of it. Uh, but like if you don't remember it, that is. But like, yeah, I don't. Oh my god! Yes, I found it. I found it. Okay. <laughs> If, if you want to know what he looks like, everyone, literally just Google crying Madarame and you will see it. It is, it is hilarious. I sent it to Jess just now. Oh. That does look great. Yeah. I just love how wide open his mouth. Yeah, his face looks like it's melting. Like. But, uh. But yeah, he Madarame like someone, is like, definitely. He looks like someone who's fake crying. Yeah, like exactly. An actor. Yeah, definitely. And like, uh, so, 
I, I guess uh, we can lead into uh, what? You, let, let's talk about a couple of the confidants. Uh, so, uh, oh, before that, oh, what's uh, up? So I go into two things that are like staples of every arc with the palaces. Oh yeah. What is what is the awakening for a character's persona, which mm -hmm. feels amazing, seeing them, uh, like, finally stand up for himself and be filled with his rebellious spirit and ready to take on this challenge that's been beating the shit out of them. It's, it's oh, yeah. just so good every time. And mm -hmm. then after you beat the ruler, after you do that boss fight, you see the palace ruler turn. And more so in the real world, it's just so satisfying seeing them like come like more or less come to a sense, I guess, uh, and admit to all their crimes. It's just it's so good. <laughs> yeah, it's it's, it's good, a real good like, feeling. It's such good like emotional or story uh uh reward for beating a palace. Right, you get to see like the direct result of your actions, you know? You it's not like uh like in an RPG, like, oh, you saved the town, but everyone continues living about their normal lives, right? Like, you actually get to see, you know, Kamoshida, Matarame, you know, Kaneshiro's next. It, like, well, Kaneshiro, I don't think you get to see in person, right? But no. you, you find out what he does, and, like, that, granted, it's not as cool, but, like, you find out what happens, and that he turned himself in, and the... Basically, the underground drug ring that he was running is now null and void, right? So, yeah, it, it's just it's it's so good. <laughs> but you got your uh, own new confidants. Yeah. So, uh, what did you think of? Uh, let's let's go with uh, Takemi, the doctor, and uh, Ey, the the gun shop owner. What did you think of those two? Uh, one was much more useful than the other. <laughs> um, <laughs> why, you gotta, why do you gotta roast my Yakuza boy, Iwai, that, like that? <laughs> Listen, it's just, okay, you, you're you required to have, like, little four guts to start him. Oh, yeah, that that not, was kind of shitty. Into it for, which means you're not starting his comp for a while until the game. So yeah, like, that's all this true. So stuff really isn't that useful by then like like you can get a discount on your stuff and uh different things for your guns but like it's brand and all but like you're not really hurting for damage by the time you get those <laughs> yeah that's true uh but the story was great seeing that this guy managing a a model gun shop it was actually part of the yakuza uh <laughs> And, uh, trying to help him, uh, protect him and his, uh, son from, uh, people out to get him and take advantage of him. Uh, uh mm -hmm. and to come is just really heartwarming seeing it all, she, oh, everything she's doing, doing is to, uh, help this child. She won't be able to save in the past and get to see her smile it, it's just so nice oh yeah that's that is like really heartwarming like takemi is honestly like a very like pure character right like she's not someone who like is like has some sinister side or something right like she's legitimately a good person the whole time right yeah like you you first see her as just this weird shady doctor down the street <laughs> And then you learn how she was really forced into the situation. You feel bad for her, and you really want to help her uh, make this uh, make this drug to help this kid. It's mm -hmm. just and it's just so nice. Most of the confidence <laughs> stories are really good, honestly. I yeah, you enjoy you enjoyed a majority of them then. I would say so. At most, they were decent, honestly. There was mm. one, you know which one I mean, that was just awful. But none of them are nearly <laughs> out. But, but none of them, I would say, are bad. There are certainly some that are more interesting and uh, more useful than others, but most of them don't feel like a waste of time or anything of the sort. You, you want to do them. Not just mm. for the story, but also for the 
very helpful abilities you get from them. Mm hmm And that's the thing, is like, Persona 5 does a great job incentivizing the player that even if, you know, you don't like hanging out with a specific character, generally speaking, you get a mechanical benefit for hanging out with them, at least, right? So, yeah. even if you're like, oh, I don't like the character, really, well, that's fine. You can fast forward and then get the benefits, you know? <laughs> yeah, like, even if you're not super into the story yet, you will... The game will tell you what the next ability you'll unlock for the content is, and that's super tantalizing. Oh, like, yeah. If it's a really good one, like a discount at a shop or something really useful in combat, you'll want to get that. And by, mm -hmm. maybe by the time you only get to that, you're more interested in the story. And, uh... <clears throat> another thing is, like... It's probably something I could save for the rest of the games, 3 and 4. But there's so many little things that, in this game that can give you, like, that dopamine rush of me. This little satisfying moment. Uh... You know, in other RPGs, it might... It'll, this would just be, uh, like, getting a level up, uh, being a dungeon. That's basically it. Uh, yeah. Whereas in this, you you have those, but then there's, like, the individual points for soul stats, and there's five different soul stats with five ranks of each of them. So you're building on each of them for a long time, and it's, it's always satisfying to, uh, uh, work on those little by little. And same with the confidence. Uh, most of the time, there are times you hang out with someone and you're not able to rank up. But most of the time, you do. Uh, and even if, even if uh, you don't get an ability for it, it, it is still satisfying to get that little bit more of the story and see that see the confidence meter go up a little. Mm -hmm. That whole splash screen. Uh you're making progress and there's just so many sources of that that uh make it feel so satisfying and engaged in all the different gameplay systems oh yeah definitely like <clears throat> i know uh i i mentioned this to you while we were playing the game but uh persona 5 is the only one where every single person you hang out with gives you some kind of major benefit um in Persona 3, the first time you really kind of get that is, uh, you, in Persona 3, at least, all you really get is, like, so, general for anyone who doesn't know how it works, is, uh, you have, um, social a aspects, right, where you're hanging out with friends, ranking up your relationship with them, and then that gives you like bonus experience when you go to the velvet room which is where you fuse and create new personas to use in battle right that's the that's the core gameplay loop right uh but persona 3 was the first time they did that so it was very vanilla right you didn't get a lot of benefit for it persona 4 opened it up a little more party members get you know follow-up attacks and like other options and stuff like this right uh, but then Persona 5 really expanded it. And so you're getting all these cool benefits like getting more money from battles or, you know, uh, changing how palace security works or, you know, experience points. Like, Mishima fucking sucks, like, as a character, but, but, but his confidant is arguably the best one in the game because it gives out of battle party members experience so like you want to do that <laughs> like like it ma it makes leveling up your party super easy to do you know yeah one of the best like streams of benefits you can get from top on is hidden by behind the worst confidant character <laughs> And yeah by far and, oh yeah like i and that's the thing is like I, I i've mentioned this a thousand times like to friends and you and everything but like overall mishima doesn't bother me as much as everyone else but you're never gonna hear me say he's good <laughs> you're, yeah. 
You're never going to hear me say I enjoy. I enjoy his, you know, arc. Because I, I think a, a big problem a lot of uh, social links and confidants have is confirmation bias. A lot of the answers that you're supposed to give in these games is a very simple, like, I agree with you, character. I want you to feel better about yourself. Like, it's a lot of that. But nothing is as bad as Mishima when it comes to confirmation bias. He's he, He'll say, like, I'm going to do some dumb shit. And you're like, I root for you, kid. Like, you just have to egg him on all the time. And it's like, that's such bad writing. Because, <laughs> like, I don't want to get into specifics, but, like, he legit almost gets into a fight with some thugs. And you're just like, yeah, you got this, homie. Like, don't. Don't root for that. That's dumb. And it's so late into the confine that you and the rest of the group are like, hey, maybe this guy's an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, it's the last, like, maybe one or two before. ranks. It's like the last one or two ranks where you're finally like, hey, bud, listen. <laughs> and he's like, what do you mean I was being an asshole the whole time? And it's like, you've never not been an asshole all the time. <laughs> Like, they, they could have made it work. It's just the writing was not how it should have been for him. Mm -hmm. I can see, like, especially killing the effects of me of punching him back for Kawashita and made it feel like a loser. He latches on to this big success with the Phantom Thieves and feels like he can be something with that. But they just go overboard with, with that and make him this extreme fanboy of the Phantom Thieves. Mm -hmm. Uh when they go just way too far. I'm like, yeah, I'm the big producer of the Fan of Thieves. It's just, no, you're not. You're nothing special. You run a fucking forum. <laughs> you're a moderator. Chill out. <laughs> Imagine adminning a Discord server and thinking you're hot shit. Like... <laughs> That's Mishima's entire arc. He's like, I'm I'm cool, as he, like, slowly morphs into a corn cob. Like, what a lame character. Like, I'm cool, I'm cool. Like, <laughs> But, <laughs> anyway, we've been, dun we've been dunking on this shitty kid for too long. <laughs> Wasn't too uh, long. We could probably do more. But, oh, yeah. I, I swear to God, we could go for on for fucking hours, but... Uh, There's another let's... thing I can duck on for a while, but we'll get to that. <laughs> uh, so let's go to uh, uh, Kanashiro's arc with uh, Makoto, the bank, and everything like that. What did you think of this arc? Uh, <clears throat> so Kanashiro himself is maybe the most intimidating one thus far because he's literally a mob box. Mm. I did not expect to go from, oh, this really abusive PE teacher to a plagiarist, uh, abusive uh, artist celebrity to the mob boss. <laughs> 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 it's all oh, you're dealing with the mafia now. <laughs> Have fun. Yeah. <laughs> it's just something that's very real, like a very direct, very enemy here. Oh, yeah. Uh, Kai, so... He himself is maybe not probably isn't the most interesting. It's just what he is, being a mob boss. He mm -hmm. as a character is what you'd expect for a mob boss. <laughs> What's more interesting from that arc is probably Makoto, because up to that point in the game, she's kind of an asshole. <laughs> oh, very <laughs> much, all... yeah. At the yeah, she's just you know, like she's in the intro cutscene. You know she's gonna join at some point. You're like, how the hell is this this jerk gonna be part of the band? <laughs> <laughs> but over time, you see how uh, all this weight that's put on her and all the responsibility she she has, and how she's cut off from her sister, and all this stuff, and how she's forced to be in the position she's in, mm -hmm. and you start to really feel bad for her. So then, and then she does something really ballsy with kind of Shiro. Is that a spoiler thing? What she does there? Uh, probably not. She 
She fucking like chases after him and gets caught. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Basically getting kidnapped. Uh, and it leads to, uh, how the, how the consequence for that one is set up. It's like, wow, that was really ballsy and kind of stupid. <laughs> but it's it's her attempt to break free from just walking on this path everyone has set for her and just trying to break out of that and be someone on her own two feet. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that's just really fun to witness. Yeah, for sure. It... Also, also the palace is a floating bank. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Uh, oh God, give, here, you know what, let, for a minute, let's talk about the music. I absolutely oh, adore the bank theme. It's the the song is called Price, by the way. Just Price. It's that it's that small. I sent it, a link to you, and everyone on stream can hear it right now. But uh, I love like the the groovy sort of like aesthetic this song has. I don't know if that's the term for it. I don't I don't know quite what I mean. Mm -hmm. But like but like this is this is the first Palace theme where I'm like, oh, this clicks for me. This is like. Not that the music didn't click before. Persona music's a fucking banger no matter what, right? But, like, just something about this song was, like, the first Palace song where I was like, oh, yeah, we're, we're like, in here, you know? I forgot about that tune completely. That is way too groovy for my <laughs> number. It's, it's too groovy, dude. That's yeah, the... most of the Palace... I'll, I'll be honest, most of the Palace things themselves I forgot, because... You don't hear as much as like when you're just traveling around town or fighting enemies or whatever. Mhm. Mm yeah. <laughs> but uh, the sound. Well, let's uh, get into it now. The soundtrack as a whole is one of the best soundtracks in all of gaming. <laughs> oh <laughs> my! Saying. Oh my God! That that's a fucking let's go. You really liked it. <laughs> I am I rough? Am I wrong? <laughs> I'm, okay, here, here's the deal. You're right, first of all. It's amazing. <laughs> like, this soundtrack elevates it to a whole nother level, right? Because I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna out who said it, because, you know, uh, I, I think they're still a very good person, and I don't want to call them out, but they, they basically said that, like, music in gaming is one of the lower parts of the experience. Like, it doesn't matter as much. And I'm like, you clearly have not played enough RPGs because, <laughs> be, because not that RPGs can't carry themselves on story gameplay and you know characters and all this other stuff but like the music for me in Persona 5 especially well all the Persona games elevates these games to another tier like the music is part of the experience you know like it, playing Persona 5, but having, like, a soundtrack, like, I don't, I don't know, like... New Super uh, Mario. <laughs> yeah, right, like, if you were to put the soundtrack for New Super Mario Brothers in Persona 5, I'd, I'd fucking laugh at you. Like, it's crap. Like, it's bad. <laughs> and, that, and that's not to say New Super Mario Bros. music isn't good for New Super Mario Bros., but, like, it doesn't... It new Super Bar But no one's listening to New Super Mario Bros. and being like, oh, yeah... That was a 10 out of 10 soundtrack. Everyone's just like, <laughs> I like it. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, all right. It's passable. It, it yeah, exists. It's music that you can hear, and that's <laughs> what it was set out to be. But Persona 5 not only made music you can hear, it made sure you heard <laughs> nothing but that. Like, you know, like... <laughs> and it made sure you stuck in your mind for hours on end. How, how many fucking times have you, like, caught yourself, like humming the lyrics to like last surprise or take over you know like those the songs are goddamn bangers dude <laughs> yeah like i have takeover running in my mind right now it's, it's so good like i don't remember the lyrics for, for most of these songs but like i remember how they go right the beat of them it's just and, and that's the what music matters. is yeah the, <laughs> yeah the music is part of why Persona 5 at least has so much of the style it does because of how bombastic and jazzy the music is mm. it's, it's just so loud and 
uh, out there and it wants you to pay attention to it. It's it's so good. Oh yeah, for Color, sure. Colors colors flying high, take over, last surprise. Uh, the um. Uh, uh, life will change. That was the name. That's the name. Oh yes, it's life true. will change. Let's go. Wait. Okay, side note. I hate that such a freaking good song is kind of desensit. Uh, you're not <laughs> incentivized to hear it much because you only hear it when the security level is full blast and you're running through the palace just to get to the treasure. But at that point, it's much safer and easier just to work to the last safe room. See, <laughs> you're not going to hear it much. Man, you play, but you play on bitch mode. You're supposed to run your ass to the fucking finish on that. You you take your fucking victory lap in in those sections. That's what you got to do. Like, don't make me bust out my PS5 right now and play this shit on stream. I swear to God, I'll do it. <laughs> but like, okay, but, you remember what happened the first when I did try to do that on the first palace? So I got my shit kicked in. But I but I told you it would be rough, and you were like, uh. I guess I'll try. And I'm like, okay, thank you for at least trying. But, like, ah, I don't know. Like, when when you get the music blaring, you don't care about the challenge. You're like, yeah, get that fucking boss in here. Let's go. Like, so good. It, Even, like, uh, all the more casual tunes of... Uh, when oh, like when you're walking around night. the city and stuff? Like, yeah. uh, Beneath the Mask, Tokyo Daylight, stuff like that. Yeah, I don't know the names, <laughs> but uh, even our the more like purposeful tunes for soothing moments where it's like very suspenseful, or why mm. not, or like the when it switches back to those scenes of the interrogation and it's all very tense. It all those little scenes, or when you're confronting a palace ruler, uh, they're they're just so good to, about adding to the scene and adding to the mood mm -hmm. and <laughs> make sure. Make sure you feel the intent and emotion at that moment. Oh, yeah. Definitely. And that's the thing, right? Is like, every song in Persona 5, it, in sort of the Persona series in general, never misses a beat when, when it's time to play the right song. Or when it's not time to play the right song. Like, I don't want to spoil anything, but there's a, a moment in Persona 4 where they straight up don't play music for one scene. And it's extremely powerful. Like that, like they they don't try to make a special piece for the scene or anything like that. It's literally dead silence, and it's perfect. But then, yeah, because some, sometimes silence is the most effective form of sound. I guess that's it can be way more effective than any music you can make for a scene. Exactly, and th and that's the thing, right? It's like when when uh, for me. Persona music in general, I have a whole video talking about it. People can go watch and uh, where I talk about my personal experience with the series, right? Where I talk for almost an hour just by myself about the entire series and what it means to me and all that, right? But, like, uh, with Persona music, it just... It always fits. Like, the whole series has only ever had, like, one composer working on it. And every time a new game comes out, it's an entirely different genre. And it's wild to me that someone can do that, you know? Like, like the fact that Persona 1 is like a synth techno kind of thing, right? Like a very, like, like almost trance music. It's really cool. And then Persona 2 in Eternal Punishment... Uh, Innocent Sin and Eternal Punishment, they have, like, a lot of rock and stuff like that, right? Oh, my God, so good. But then, like, Persona 3 with rhythm and blues, and then Persona 4 with techno and, like, and then Persona 5 with with fucking acid jazz? What the fuck? Let's go! Like, it's just... There was a it's... jazz club you can go and tune in the game, but it feels like you're in a jazz club the entire game. Yeah, right, ex <laughs> like exactly. Jazz you get, and it's so good. Oh, exactly. Like, <laughs> I, I think you went to that jazz club, what, once in the entire game? <laughs> yeah, there's no actual reason going to it in-game, but, yeah. I mean, there is a reason, and it is beneficial, but you don't... Like, you were able to beat the entire game just fine without it, you know? Like... Yeah. It's another one of those situations where, like, the game just gives you so many options, it doesn't 
<laughs> it, it, it like overloads you, but at the same time, it's like, you know, it's sort of like pick which cake you want to eat because they all taste the same. But yeah, because so, so a lot of them are just redundant, or some are burning over, so you don't eat too all of them. So yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. But yeah, I guess all the say about the music. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, let it, we haven't done really like. What do you think about the bosses? Like, we, we talked a little bit about, like, the character part, like, the story part of it, right? And we talked a little bit about, like, the music, like, when Life is Life Will Change is playing and you, you get that epic theme going as you're storming the, the palaces, right? But what do you think about the boss fights so far? Like, all three of the first, like, arc, I guess. Uh, insanity? <laughs> Probably a good way to describe them. I just love how they're this huge, monstrous portrayal of, like, the demons of that character brought brought to physical form. Especially with Kamoshida eating up these trophies, his slaves, being the volleyball members, are bringing to him. Uh, mm. Being this hideous, grotesque monster with a giant tongue. With, oh, yeah. Uh, obedient version of An next to him. It's... it's <laughs> It's, it's just so cool seeing this terrifying uh, and tuning version of the character in its, in its fullest form. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the fight, but the fights themselves are great too. Uh, I love the parts of them where one character has to run off to do something special. Uh, like with uh, Kamashi Danger, uh, I forget what it was. <laughs> But you have to run off and do something. Like you're breaking something or distracting him or doing whatever uh, to get an edge in the fight. In the fight, because otherwise you're not going to do much. Right. Otherwise, the fights are uh, boost yourselves up, do a ton of damage. Um, <laughs> uh, but they're really fun and interesting and you know, I love how wacky they get like the Madarami's is <laughs> it's a face but it's made of four different paintings that resemble facial features mm -hmm. it's, it's really hard and annoying because each one has different resistances and you get the, that black goop all over you and it's awful oh yeah the uh, uh, the ink the ink ailment yeah yeah and then Kanashiro's the Absolutely safe, uh, machine. Oh, Piggytron! Piggytron! Which, I've, I've said, uh, before, but it really just reminds me of what the absolutely safe capsule thing from Mother 3. Yeah, uh, it, it, it very much reminds me of that as well. It's like the, the spherical shape and the silver tone definitely do it. Yeah, I'm being, supposedly being super impenetrable. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I just love seeing these realizations of how the rulers act and having to fight them and the satisfaction afterwards of seeing them cower. Mm hmm And I, and I see like I'm I'm of two minds with this, right? Like I I enjoy the bosses in Persona Five because uh, well, in general, modern Persona games only have bosses for, like, big, important story arcs, really. Uh, like, you know, you get your mini-bosses and stuff like that. You get plenty of those. But, like, a lot of other RPGs, sometimes bosses are just kind of like... Sometimes bosses are just things that show up, you know? Like, there's, there's one boss in Final Fantasy X. It's like a random mech that shows up out of nowhere when you cross like this big grass field like an abandoned mech shows up and that's your boss fight for the area it's no story relation whatsoever but like it's yeah that could be a thing that happens in RPGs you're just going along with somebody with a boss fight yeah and and like there's nothing wrong with that style right now obviously I adore Final Fantasy X as well and I feel like I, the fact that I brought it up more than twice is weird but <laughs> Like, a, a lot of the time, you know, bosses don't make a whole lot of sense when they're done like that. Whereas Persona 5, it's an event. A boss fight is a big deal, you know? 
and it's you, always something that's built up to you. you always know who you're about to fight when you get there mm -hmm. and you're always you're always like prepared for it in some sense like I'm on the Kamashi arc I'm going to fight Kamashi at the end of this <laughs> I, I yeah, one down even if, go ahead like and, like their their objective for every palace is stealing a treasure and getting out I have to say, I feel like they would recognize by some point, oh, hey, we always end up fighting the ruler anyway. Maybe we should just go for him first and then get the treasure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess that's true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a after, after like, four or five times, it's like, all right, guys, I think we got a strat here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, make the uh, infiltrate, get the root to the treasure, find the ruler, beat the shit out of them, and then get the treasure and get the hell out. I, I guess uh, my my one downside with how Persona Five R er, Persona Five and R uh, do bosses is I, I I'm not a big fan of the sending a party member away gimmick because that just like stonewalls you until time passes you know and like in story it's cool right because like you you know it's the characters working together to like take down this big threat right. But it mechanically, be, you know, and, and I'm not, I'm, I can't believe I'm about to talk down about the, about a turn-based RPG, but mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, when you're, when all your characters are just standing there waiting for something to happen, like, mechanically at least, it doesn't feel great, because you're just wailing yeah. on it until yeah. it's time to do more damage, you know? Yeah, that that is a downside, like. You might know from the start of the fight, you'll probably have to do that mechanic, but you don't know for sure yet, so you're just trying stuff. But by the time you send someone out, you're just waiting, basically, and just surviving until that thing happens. Mm -hmm. And if it's case like with, uh, with uh, the fourth palace, I want to say, um, where you're doing that thing multiple times, so you're just like, okay, come on, come on, just do this thing already, <laughs> so we can get on with it. Yeah, right. And it can be a little annoying. Because mm. there's... Because your attacks ain't worth shit until you do the thing and get the boss down. There's did, like nothing uh, that you can do. Did, uh... Did Matarame have a moment like that? I want to say no, right? Uh... I, if, if I remember right, like, you said he did. But it wasn't, like... It wasn't a mandatory thing. So, like, we skipped it. Because we beat him up enough... That we passed the phase where this thing would have been useful to do. So, if I remember what you said at the time, like, the thing was to just, like, get rid of him using the black goop or, like, use that on him. But, uh, we took care of that phase before that was able to be useful. Oh, that's right. Hmm. Yeah. Let's see here. Uh,. Yeah, I, I I guess we just there isn't a thing like that. Weird. I, I looked it up and I, I do like that the wiki points up. by the way, don't look at the SMT wiki if you need like if you want to look something up for Persona 5, it will spoil you on things. Just na in the names of characters alone, it will spoil things for you. Um Yeah, especially a certain royal exclusive thing. Do not yeah. look at certain wikis. <laughs> yeah, that you yeah. might see that that name. Yeah, exactly. You definitely don't look at that. But, um, <laughs> but uh, anyway, I I do like that the wiki points out in the royal section of Madarame that, that the first sentence Madarame is significantly easier in royal. <laughs> and and that's actually true. Uh, the whole like boss fight with him splitting into multiple characters thing, he didn't do that in the original. He only did the painting thing. So he was one painting in the original? No, he, he was the four paintings, but he didn't split into the four individual Matarames. He didn't do that in the original. Oh, that part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that part was really easy. <laughs> yeah, that part was easier than the painting part. Far easier, cause like they tell you, they tell you exactly what to hit them with. Mm -hmm. So you can, you just do that, and then you just wail on Madrami. It was really easy. Whereas <laughs> with the paintings, you have 
there's so many different resistances to worry about. So you often can't do a multi-hit uh, skill. And you have them like constantly reviving each other and using the black paint. It's just, it gets to be really annoying. Oh, and yeah. And the second phase is piss easy by comparison. It, it very much is, yeah. Like, I'm, I'm wondering, like, because, like, overall, um, the, uh, the game, the game is easier, like, they tone down a lot of the bosses, but, like, <laughs> I don't know what the fuck happened in, uh, <laughs> in Royal, where, like, not only is every boss easier, but the one boss that was, like, kind of just fine, they made brutally difficult, <laughs> like, <laughs> And, like, granted, I was here to kind of help you with that boss, but, like, it was still a pain in the ass boss that we'll get to later, you know? Like, yeah, that oh. was still an annoying and dumb gimmick. <laughs> I didn't need to be there. Mm hmm. Oh, but, uh, anyway, uh, moving on. Uh, oh, jeez. So, so much to do in the game, right? Um, <laughs> what, what, you know well, what? Here. Uh, let's talk about uh, mementos a little bit. What did what do you, what have you, oh, we yeah. haven't even brought that up at all? Like, what what did you think of mementos? Uh, I really like mementos. It's great. Uh, so in five, uh, after you're done with the palace, it disappears, so you can't go back to it, which mm -hmm. is dumb. Uh, yep. But that means that if you want any kind of action, you want that type of gameplay, you're way until the next palace. In the, in the story uh which you're not just going to speed through to it mm -hmm. uh so otherwise it's kind of, it would be kind of a bummer if it was just the, the social side of things until then so it's great that you have mementos there to uh to get that combat in in the meanwhile um and it's not just you fight the enemies kind of stop you have uh like Misha will, will randomly text you about uh targets there uh, to take out, or when you get to a certain point and all the confidence that aren't part of your party, uh, you have to take out a target to help them. And so it's cool that uh, uh, you get all these smaller storylines that you're able to resolve uh, because of Mentos being there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the uh, we're only generating a part of it can make some for some very fun floors. <laughs> like, like we see, we saw multiple times a floor that was just a square or just a straight line or just a plus sign. Um, but they, it is is a really fun thing to go through. Apparently, it was made much better in Royal. Oh yeah. Uh, you want to talk about those changes? <laughs> yeah. So, uh. Basically, uh, Mementos was, uh, for fans of the series, it's, you know, well, fans of the series have pl played it already, but um, it was, the original was like Tartarus and Persona 3, where it was just one long dungeon, right? And it, granted, Persona 3 mixed it up where each floor looked a little different in terms of style, right? Like each section of Tartarus looked different, but um, I don't know what it... That game. <laughs> yeah right uh i don't know what it was but like in persona 5 royal they were just like oh it's way easier if we just like if we just like <laughs> made it good now like <laughs> <laughs> like each like section saying, like, the... is different and like like mechanically it's a lot better right like they added the stamps feature and they added you know like just so much more over the vanilla game that I'm shocked, like... Because originally you just kind of put up with Mementos being there, but in Royal it's, like, <laughs> actually kind of fun. It's actually really fun, unless you're going for, like, an hour straight of Mementos. In that case, you want to get the hell out. Which happened <laughs> a couple times. Uh... Because you just had, had like, went, have, uh, too many targets to go through. Uh... It's, it's crazy to think that in the vanilla version, you had just one aesthetic to go through the entire Mementos. Because mm -hmm. it, it's really cool uh, in Royal seeing, like, you go through, like, reds and purples and orange and 
it gets like black and it gets really creepy, you know, kind of unsettling to go through. And the dead ends, they end like they add like tombstones there. <laughs> it's like, what the hell is this? It gets really, like really demented mm. and like straight out of hell. It's really cool seeing how like the further you go in, the the more distorted the area it gets, which is the whole point of, of Mementos. It's the uh, it's like the collective palace for the public instead of being for an individual. Uh, so the further you go, the more distorted things get and the worse for where things are. And it's just great. And uh, with Jose, you have uh, the stamps to find every floor. You have one at the end of every floor and sometimes you'll find one uh, randomly in floors like behind a braille wall or whatever so like it's great for giving you another thing to look for in mento so it's not just the combat and occasionally a chest mm -hmm. uh granted the downside to jose is he breaks the game in half <laughs> oh yeah totally <laughs> Cause like because he's part of he adds to the money problem you get so much money because with the stamps, you can spend him with Jose to alter the condition of Mentos to make it so you get more XP from fights, uh, more money from negotiations and fights, or more items from the like the little capsules, the little bubble things you are into through Mentos. And items and uh, the money, you'll get so many fucking treasures that you can sell. For more money and just adding a little onto the experience part of it, you will get so fucking OP. Like, <laughs> like when it came time for the final palace of the main game, uh not going into details about it, but uh like you see like different levels of auras around the shadows, like there's green or green, blue, uh orange and red. And mm -hmm. like flaming, signifying how much of a fat they are compared to your current level. Uh, I think most of the enemies I ran into in that final palace were blue and orange, but there was a lot of blues, I think. <laughs> and oh, the opening part. Yeah, definitely a lot of greens too, which like ran from yeah. you because they were ready to get the fuck which out of there. there. <laughs> Yeah, greens you stomp on all over the place, <laughs> which is insane. Literally, like, one of the abilities you get from Ryuji, I think, was his confidant. Uh, if an enemy is weak enough, you just run straight to them and you're you're done. You don't even initiate a fight. Uh, yeah, his think, his rank that, seven confidant. Only, yeah, I think is that only from Mementos, I think. Uh, not 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 only for mementos because but the the thing was is that palaces are actually balanced a little more to accommodate your level so <laughs> I, I, yeah. I and i stress that a little more so you're not going to run into palaces as much but mementos is like fodder it's just free nothing but freebies in mementos <laughs> yeah so like you're running around in the the morgana mobile ah <laughs> <laughs> uh, you 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 dash right into a shadow and you kill him instantly. It's it's insane. Uh yeah, Mentos is really fun. I love the progress of going deeper and deeper and changing condition. The flowers in them is kinda dumb because the items you get are pretty good, but they cost so much you're not gonna get that many items before you have to bounce. And the mm. flowers don't carry over to your next time going into Mentos, so it's not that helpful yeah you'll get what you'll have only ever do for the most part unless you're in there for a really long time uh you use the flowers to get a couple sp items and that's it because with the item selection he has uh i don't know maybe we're really into uh uh tinkering with getting better uh items with the blank and model shit I didn't find any use to that. We didn't. Uh, <laughs> so, whenever you're looking at his item list, I'm pretty sure nine times out of ten, you're just going to go straight for the SP items first and foremost. And yep. that's all you're going to be able to get. 
Yep. Because they cost so much, and you're not going to be able to buy anything else while you're there. Yeah, like, unless you literally just grind out flowers over and over again, you're not going to afford more than one or two items. Yeah, the only time we got more than that was near the end of the game. Uh, when I was just grinding out the rest of the stamps just for the sake of getting them all. And by then, I was able to... That was the only time I got more than the SV items from him. So I was getting so many flowers. I got, yeah. like, any worthwhile item from him. But that was the only time it happened. Mm-hmm. Also, it's... they give you... The stamp tools are just way too much. <laughs> <laughs> What's kind of funny is... I, I convinced you to get all the stamps. <laughs> Even though, <laughs> even though it doesn't even give you a trophy, if I recall. <laughs> I don't think it did, which is crazy, because that was so much grinding. So, like, Mementos is broken into these areas, and each area has its own collection of stamps to get. Mm -hmm. And past, like, the first couple of areas, you will need to redo that area over and over to get all the stamps. Mm -hmm. And there's no point to it. <laughs> Not only because you don't get anything for getting all the stamps, because, like, you're perfectly fine not redoing those areas to get more and more stamps. You're perfectly fine just going straight through, because you have more than enough to get a ton of extra XP and buying your items from Jose. You're never left wanting to get more of that, so it's like, mm. why aren't the tile, the totals just lowered, like, by, like, half for how much you need to right. spend all that stuff? And that's the thing is, like, even with the item boost, like, fucking I the flowers and shit are worthless, right? Like, you, you get, like, the item scraps, right? Which are good for, like, making items and stuff, right? Like, you know, uh... Well, even then, like, by, by a point in the game, you have so many materials you don't know what to do with. And exactly. And the treasures are for selling, which you don't need a ton of money for it <laughs> by any way. So even right. that's made worthless after a point. And then like, by a point, by after wasn't, a point, you're. Wasn't there a point? It wasn't there a point where like we got a bunch of material, and so you crafted like twenty of each of those items for like, uh, oh, that yeah. deals like fifty damage of whatever element, right? And so we crafted a bunch of those in the hopes of like, oh hey, if we just need a quick baton pass, there we go. But by that point in the game, our party was just fucking killers. <laughs> it didn't matter. Yeah, so I really used his items, but I uh, made them just because I could. Because I was maxed out on several of the materials. Uh, I mean, in hindsight, I wish I I do wish I uh, craft materials less because of how much I use them and how much extra time I can use to do whatever else. But like, uh, but yeah, you just get so fucking OP because of Jose, because mm -hmm. of him. <laughs> <laughs> your level gets raised so much you get so much extra money that nothing is a threat anymore yeah exactly like nothing nothing could stop you if you just beef up a little bit in uh like the experience and money category you know yeah. like like I'm two or three ranks like... would be fine but the fact you can go up to 10 is just oh, such overkill <laughs> yeah I feel like they should have like cut that rank total by half at least by half <laughs> so the, yeah. There was some semblance of of the physical seeker. Right, exactly. Uh so oh hey, uh Wild Skull Kid Tiger has appeared. Yo, seems cool. Late night chat. Yeah, we're Yo. chilling, dude. Uh Hello. just as a heads just as a heads up, uh there might be spoilers, but I do have a spoiler bumper to let you know so you can like mute it and then when you see the bumper go away, you know it's cool to come back. So just as a heads up, we might be talking spoilers. Um, yeah, and we are like, Story Wars, we're getting to like maybe halfway, over halfway. Uh, yeah, we're, through we're so roughly. Yeah, we're roughly. Yeah, we're definitely halfway through by now. Um, yeah, we haven't had much to say up to this point because up until I would say like uh, the Okuma arc, there is like nothing. You have no clues or anything fed to you about the story. Well, the, I, I wouldn't say that. I you do get two hints in the previous palaces. 
okay, yes, you get those things about, like, oh, there's someone else wandering around through the houses, but, like, that's basically, you get nothing, basically nothing uh, in, like, the real world about it. And I have a problem with the approach of you do list these mini arcs, these chapters, while the main story develops in the background, mm-hmm. but the pacing of when the story develops is so slow. You mm-hmm. get, like, nothing up until Hokumra, where, like, everything starts happening all at once. Right. Up until then, the most you really get are those... Like a Those teases of, of someone else hap- uh, going around the houses. Other than that, the only things you get are those scenes of the SIU director talking to someone else on the phone, which amounts to nothing at the time. Yeah, that's true. You don't true. get anything useful out of that. No that's useful true. information or hints, really. And and that's and that's <laughs> true uh, because like, and that and that's the thing I mentioned to you going into Persona Five is the pacing of the story is very poor like that's it that's all <laughs> it's it's a legitimate downside the pacing at least the story itself is great you just have to deal with the constant like how back-ended the story is in terms of like how good it gets right like you have good like we were talking earlier about how great the game is in terms of like connecting you to the other characters like you're driven to fight you know the villains you encounter throughout the game but from an overall narrative perspective, it's very poor in that you don't really get the beefy meat of the story until the later half. And that's, like, kind of fucked up, you know? Like, yeah, cause... we're talking, like, late August, like, mid-September is when the story finally kicks into gear. <laughs> yeah, because it's not like the individual tagging you fight Kamashi and Mara, et etc., at least seemingly at, at this point have anything to do with the main story. Mm-hmm. Up until then, like, you're still wondering why the hell is Ren stuck in uh, jail and interrogation room at the start of the game? Uh, and you see the scene uh, early on, uh, this flashback of him uh, one before the events of the game, going up to a woman who's being harassed by some guy. And because you attempt to save them, this new uh, gets the cops on you. You're falsely charged uh, in for assault. Yeah, yeah, for assault, and that like sets you on a course for uh, living on the block and everything else. And that's like you can probably surmise that 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 dude there is probably going to be the final boss because he has a close connection to the main character, and mm-hmm. he's the one that. Kicked, that ruined your life more or less. Was yeah. Felt like at the time. Uh, and and then, then he makes a couple of nothing. not so subtle appearances throughout the story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also, like, it takes Ren a stupid amount of time to understand. Like, yes, this is the guy that did you over all those years ago, or how long he was. You I, are, I, you I think what they. I think what they're trying to imply is like because most of the game is told through flashback they're trying to imply that like he vaguely remembers meeting a guy but doesn't remember the details you know yeah that's fair i i think that's the idea i don't think i approve of the writing process but i think that's what they were going for yeah i can get that but from the player's point of view where you see his face and then you see it again like and again, and <laughs> again. <laughs> well, like at that, uh, when they're celebrating uh, changing Kamoshida's heart uh, at that fancy restaurant, and they bump into him at an elevator, mm. you see his face, and that the most telltale sign is his orange tinted glasses. Mm-hmm. Um, that's who who it is, but you know, no one recognized him. Mm-hmm. Uh. So you don't you don't think about him again until much much later. Mm-hmm. Where you're not going after him because of what happened to you, it's because of other stuff he's doing. Right. I don't know. I I I I like the story they tell. I just wish you got bigger hints and more important hints spaced out, you know? Yeah. Like because like you said, it's it's 
it's the tiniest and tiniest of of drips of something up until everything happens. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I I mentioned this in a long gone discussion I did with my friends when the vanilla game came out. Uh we we all agreed we think it would have been a lot cooler and a way in a way better paced story if they combined uh Makoto and Haru's arcs together like because uh it, they they loosely imply it in the story but the whole Ar Haru arc and the uh the Kanashiro arc those two are like the biggest sources of money for the villain so it yeah i you know what here i'm gonna put up the spoiler bumper just in case hang on yeah well bam okay so we are talking about spoilers so so with kanashiro and okumura's arcs right um it's it's heavily implied that those are the biggest sources of his income uh yeah the the the, the villain of the story, right? So it, it makes me wonder, why not just tie the two together and have, like, two... Like, a cool moment of back-to-back -back palaces, you know? Or, like, have it be, like, the Phantom Thieves have to tackle both palaces in a certain deadline, you know? Like, something cool like that, right? But instead, we get the Kanashiro stuff, and then the story takes a complete backseat for many, many months, you know? Yeah, because so like, uh, when you're in that final palace, and you see those connections to him, it's it's cool to see it tying back to earlier rulers and stuff. Like, oh, this one did this, this one did this, for <laughs> for Shido. But it also would have been nice to get that information back when you fought them, to establish yeah. that earlier, to have something tied to Shido, tied to the larger narrative as a whole. As a whole. So you right. learn that, like, Kanashiro was, not only was he, you know, a mafia boss, <laughs> he was funneling his, uh, illegal money to Shido. Right. Uh, but you don't get that mentioned until the last palace, while you're about to fight him. Right. So they could have, they could have, uh, brought up those connections, or like with Medjed, which we'll get to, uh, a lot sooner, maybe. And that could have helped a lot. Right. Like, they could have done a better job tying all of this together. But I... And they could have introduced Haru into the story a lot earlier to give you a better, like, incentive to use her, you know? Like... Like, yeah, you might have had, a, like, a lull between... Uh, and I still have the spoiler tag up for this. When you get to Futaba's palace... Um... There would have been downtime during summer break in September, but honestly, I think you could have just bumped everything up a little more and spaced it out better at the end, you know? So you're not just dumped with story in the last, you know, the f final moments of the game, you know? Yeah. Especially because uh, with the Thomas Palos, you were... The aim of that story-wise, the reason you do that is just so she can then turn around and deal with Medjed. Yeah. So, Putan herself wasn't really an antagonist. You're doing that for the purpose of dealing with the main antagonist to that story on which you don't really, you don't put a face to Medjed at all. Uh. Yeah. So, it's just Putava, and you, you change her heart, and then Medjed is dealt with, and well, that's that it. Well, that's the thing. You, techni time. you technically don't even change her heart. She changes it herself, without yeah. the Phantom Thieves interfering. Uh, well, granted, they obviously had to interfere for that whole situation to happen the way it did. But, yeah, she pushed. They pushed her along. Right, and and don't get me wrong. I like how Futaba's palace is handled, even des especially design wise. I think it's a great palace with great puzzles, and I like that it's. A central hallway with branching puzzles that you solve. That's such a cool concept, you know? Yeah. But, like... But, like, narratively, remember, it's worthless. <laughs> yeah, kind of. So I remember when I was starting that part of it, I was thinking, oh, so are we going to have, like, two bounces back-to-back? -back? It's like, do Futaba, and then she... 
uncovers a ton of information about Medjed, so we get to do a palace related to them. But no, we just do Mutaba, and then she deals with Medjed, and that's it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's yep. that that whole like anything between Kanoshiro and Okumura's palace is like kind of a low point in the game in terms of storytelling, right? Like it's it's yeah. not. It's not super vital to the overall narrative, and they could have easily worked in other elements of the story to fit in there to to help f the back half of the game feel less bloated, you know? Yeah. Or it uh, was more like what Medjad really was in that instance, and, you know, get more of an antagonist feel in that uh, chapter, because all this is Futaba, which is great. But well, you don't have an actual like classic uh standard uh antagonist that you're working towards uh kicking the shit out of <laughs> at the end of that palace. Right. You have the cognition of one, and that's it. Right. Basically. And it is kind of cool that they like again, like I like how Futaba's palace is handled because I told you this. That's how dungeons in Persona 4 are handled. They're all personal stories and there's oh, still yeah. an there's still an overarching narrative and but all the characters tie into it so even even if all the all of the individual uh dungeons in persona 4 the in of themselves are not vital to do in terms of narrative the characters related to them are and you're you're saving them so it's very yeah. important so like that's that's the big difference there, right? Whereas Futaba sticks out in this game, right? Like it, like I said, it's just a big lull in the story, and you don't really do a lot, and that's a bit unfortunate, you know. It um, uh, it takes this balance of like it's a yeah, the main tags you're dealing with, and it might be somewhat loosely related to the story, and also your one of your party members is the victim of them, and. It, completely offsides that into <laughs> it's just about this uh person who will be a future party member who you're seeing the shit they went she went through and you're saving them and that's all that it's about and, and, you, and, and let's not forget that when uh summer break ends uh which is is a great time like mechanically because you get to do a ton of social stuff right but like once the once August ends, you come back and you have to go on the school trip. And I, I've been waiting to talk about this with you because I know how like pissed you are about this event. So, honey, take it away. <laughs> like So it was this, it was like the start of August, you said? No, end of August is when this end event. End of August. Yeah, because you do Christ. you because August is your summer break. And then uh, September, like first, second week of September or something, is the school trip. So, yeah. Uh, at some point, they're telling you about, hey, like on Monday or Tuesday, this upcoming week, we're going to take a trip to Hawaii. And it's going to be a really fun thing. In the back of my mind, I'm okay. What's the shakeup going to be here? Because I'm thinking, there's no way. They're just going to have a chill-ass vacation. In the middle of this, this story, and nothing happens. Clearly, <laughs> that wouldn't be the case. There has to be some kind of conflict still. Something's gonna go wrong, and that doesn't happen. It's just a oh, trip to Hawaii, and there's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> nothing happens story-wise. Literally, absolutely nothing up until like the very end, where they're saying, "Hey, maybe we should take out Okumura," just because they saw some post on a fan site. Cool. <laughs> like that's, also, that's the only reason they're going after a cover at first because they see post out on the fan site. <sighs> uh, and just gameplay wise, there's just there's just so little to Hawaii. You walk around a little bit here or there. You make a couple choices about who you're hanging out with, and that's it. Most of it is just reading about how characters are bored about Hawaii being a disappointment or whatever or enjoying their time or whatever 
and my eyes were getting tired because <laughs> I was doing nothing but reading. And it wasn't interesting, like, later on, where you get a dump of information, and it's, it, it is interesting because it's a story. But here, it's, it's nothing. It's just filler, it feels like. Filler for filler's sake, they're not expanding really on the character arcs or anything important. It's just filler for filler's sake, it feels like. Right. It's, it's disappointing because, like, it's it's weird that I'm I'm gonna give Persona Four credit uh, again. I'm sorry you haven't played it, but I'm what? gonna bring it up. <laughs> Persona Four has arguably a lot more breaks when it comes to like random events like that, but they're always done as like party member like bonding experiences that like it, like if you weren't doing the social link stuff, it would feel like just a normal RPG weirdly enough like you're you're just getting character bonding in the story and yeah. like I think that's actually really important to Persona 4's whole vibe where it's a lot more chill like laid back right but in, another thing is the events don't take a fucking week of in game time like <laughs> they take like and it feels at, like an eternity <laughs> it takes Christ. at most it takes at most like a day or two like in game, like it's and and one of them is actually vital to the story. So like, it's important. What? Yeah, like wild, right? Like yeah, like like before, like in the last arc, I think it was like, oh, they took a school trip to this TV station, and there was some mildly important story stuff that happened there. You were meeting a catchy and stuff for him. Um. So, and you're thinking, like, whenever there's this big break where the team goes somewhere, there, there's going to be something related to the story, or they might sell up on the next target. That doesn't <sighs> happen to any extent, really, for <sighs> most of Hawaii until the very end, where, again, they see, oh, there's some post on a fan site. You should probably look into a Kumara. <laughs> yep. It's, it's <laughs> literally, <laughs> like, it's literally, like, two or three sentences at the very end. It's just, hey, Mishima is really obsessed with the fan site still, a little surprise. And there's uh, a lot of votes about taking out Akumura. Wow, a corrupt CEO. Who would have thought that'd be a target at some point? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, that's that's all you get. My, I was literally having a hard time staying awake during that part. <laughs> because there was nothing going on. It was just a lot of reading about nothing. And, and, and that's the thing, right? It's like after this, you get to the Akumara arc, right? And this is where the game actually, like, picks up in terms of narrative a little bit. Like, Both the and, narrative and the the chapter itself being really interesting. Yeah, exactly. Like, the okay. whole, the whole like, story with Okumura and his stuff, right? Like, it's, it's, it's like a really real thing. You get to learn about, like, um, sort of the the food industry, like the fast food industry, well, I guess companies in general, right? Where, like, a, a lot of the time, it's, it's, it's very, like, it's a, I, for lack of a better term, uh, it's a sweatshop, right? Like, you, the whole thing is, oh, fill it with bodies, you know, run it into the ground. It doesn't matter if the employees die, the, the money is what matters at the end of the day, right? Like, <coughs> Okumura is a fucking dick. Uh, yeah, and especially in a palace like this one, we are constantly seeing how the victims of his actions are treated. It's 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 soul crushing mm -hmm. seeing how he views people in the real world. Or the workers are seen as just robots, just there to fill a role, and then move on. And then by towards the end of the palace, see they're they're crushed, they're tossed into this pit to be treated as fuel. So, like, yeah. it doesn't even matter if a worker collapses on the spot. Just They'll put it in a new body. That. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing. Yeah. Like, at this point in the game, they really want the player to think Okumura's got a lot more going on. Because they treat him like the villain, right? Like, the in the narrative, I mean. 
Like, like he's the one doing all this, right? Yeah, but just build him up like, oh, he might be the one. Uh, he has connections to like these all these mental shutdowns because that was we didn't mention it yet, but that's another big thing that was teased like at the start of all these random cases of mental shutdowns and psychotic breakdowns happening all over the country, and you don't know who's causing them or why or how or anything. Mm -hmm. And the lead to a coomer is the only time they find like, oh. Maybe there's a connection here, especially with uh, with uh, Futaba, because you learn that her her mother's research was stolen and mm -hmm. weren't likely being used to cause all these shutdowns. Uh, so now they're, they're trying this fuel to uh, get attached to the main narrative. Yeah. Uh, so then you have that added reason to take down Akuma, on top of he's a corrupt CEO, who would have thought, and he's about to force his daughter into a marriage. That's purely for political and monetary gain. Yep, and it's it's what's interesting is like I do appreciate like how they play out in the narrative, right? Because let, let, let's talk briefly, the Akuma boss fight sucks ass that is the worst boss fight in the game easily like because it's not even like a boss fight it's just a gauntlet of really tough enemies that like just have shit tons of health that's all it is right like mm -hmm. in terms of straight difficulty there's it's it's not there it's just mechanically it's not a great boss fight you know um semantically but, i was real saying it and i it made sense for Akumura, this CEO, like the kind of villain where, like he himself, you get straight to him. He's not gonna really do much, but mm -hmm. he'll put up all these defenses and stuff. They so have to get past. Um, yeah. So it, in that sense, it's really cool. Instead of fighting directly, because that would be like a one-shot kill. <laughs> mm -hmm. You just go these lines of employees that are uh, brainwashed in a sense to put their lives on a line for uh the source of their life <laughs> right and but but making them play just to take out the enemies more up here take them out more up here oh suddenly you have to take out all of them out at once great that's awful <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like i said mechanically it's not a great fight because it can like, a lot of people, like, if you go online, a lot of people hate the new boss fight. It's really bad. Like... I don't... Maybe it was just because I had your help, but I didn't hate it that much. Uh... I, I can promise you it's 100% because I was there helping you. Yeah, that... That's completely fair. It was probably because of that. Well, yeah. well, I and I don't mean to say that as, like, oh, I'm the one. Like, I'm the reason it was okay. Like, I'm just saying, no. like... I was able to give you a warning about, like, what you'll need going into the fight. Like, you'll need stat buff, I, you know, abilities. You'll need Haru in the team, you know, like, that kind of stuff, right? Like, it was... Yeah. I, w I was able to kind of, like, prep you a little bit. And I, that made the fight a lot easier. We only had to... I don't even think we had to redo it, right? We just had to no. grind out a few more of the rounds, right? So... I mean, like, we never redid a fight. We never, at no point in the game, that have a full party wipe. Yeah, that's it's true. Kind of crazy. Yeah, yeah, and that can and that can happen though, especially on like the harder difficulties. Like, I know some people oh, are yeah, like, sure. "Oh, the the hardest difficulty in the game," which I think is like, I, I forget what it's called. It's it's whatever the very hard mode is called. It basically triples damage for everybody. So both your party and enemies do triple damage, but because of that, even with the health increase for enemies, you're wiping them out, even in the early game. So it's kind of yeah. broken. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, anyway, uh, I wanted to get back to uh, with the Okumura fight. I, Actually, I do find... Yeah, oh, it's, what's up? It's a very minor thing, but like... Uh... Okumura, Shadow Okumura, like, okay, so the Shadow versions always have some, like, some unique getup to see, like, how they view themselves, like, 
Shadow Kamoshida is uh is a king who's also a perv, so he's mostly naked aside from the cape. Yeah. So which is so he's really disturbing in that sense. Uh Madarame, I think, is still just a robe, if I remember right. Uh he's uh, like a he's like he's meant to be uh he's meant to be like a shogun. Like he's a highly respected uh, individual. Uh right, right. Um I think kind of sure oh looks the exact same because you already see such a in real life. So there's not much to hide there. Right. Which was an interesting thing there. Like, there's no exposing something there aside from getting them easier to catch for the police. Uh. Then. Uh, oh. Okuma. Oh, hey. Thanks for the uh, the subs, Cole Kid. Let's go. Three months. Hey, nice. <laughs> With Okumura. It makes sense for the setting, because the palace is like the space station, and it's really cool. <laughs> Kokuma himself is dressed like fucking, like fucking Darth Vader or Mysterio. <laughs> he, yeah, he, he's meant to be Darth Vader, yeah. He's like the leader of a, like a evil space group. That's essentially what he's trying to be. But, at least personally, like, I can't take him seriously in that get up. Well, you're right. You're kind of not supposed to, though. Like, he's comedically, like, over the top. Yeah. <laughs> he's just in this, like, robotic suit with an, uh, uh, bubble head. Yeah. With, like, obviously with a filter or his voice as a result and all that. <laughs> it's just funny. Also, the mechanic at the end of Okumura's Palace is awful and I hate it. <laughs> I hate <laughs> it. Oh, I used it's, it's the kind of thing where uh, you flip these switches to open one path, we'll shut off others. And I, I don't know <laughs> if, if you weren't there helping me, I, w I probably would have looked up a guide in frustration. <laughs> just awful with that kind of puzzle. And then <laughs> the last room was just so big, and I hate it. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's all I wanted to say. It meant to be less than that, but yeah. I where feel you we? though. Uh, it, right, where were we? <laughs> uh, the end of uh, Okumura's arc. What I wanted to talk about was like, it's interesting that they like, they sort of trick the Phantom Thieves into believing that they won, like the villains, right? Oh yeah. Uh, and I I find they, it because they go ahead. They mentioned in the last couple of palaces that there's someone else in a black mask going around and using more so on the Kanashiro's you get more info. More uh going around and using these palaces for their own gain. Mm -hmm. And you don't really get much outside of those couple mentions up until the end of Akumura. Where you see them briefly and they shoot uh Akumura Shadow, killing him. Mm-hmm. And then you have to wait out the rest of the the time, if you had days remaining, to see the fallout of that, where the fan of these still think, oh yeah, we job's all good. Gonna see yeah. a change of heart any day now. And then, and then you oops. Start, you, you start to, like he's on a press conference and made to his crimes, and then he has a mental shutdown. Yeah, like live on TV, and they have the, the technical difficulties show up. And... Yeah. Which, it's like drawn in crayon. <laughs> <laughs> Which also, God, the, the visuals they have for so having a mental shutdown, like their eyes rolling back and blood leaking out, it's oh, so creepy. Oh yeah, it's super creepy. But yeah, it's like, think... but it's like really drives home how like fucked up it is to have it happen to someone, you know? Yeah, I think by then, uh, maybe it's a spoiler tag moment. Oh, I have, I've had the thing up the whole time, so feel oh, free. okay. I think it was before this point, maybe it was a little after, that they direct a mental shutdown at the school's principal. Mm-hmm. So that was uh, kind of a shock moment. You see, he's just walking along uh, a road, and he freezes up. He has a shutdown, and then he's hit by a car. So it's made to look like he committed suicide. So that combined with Okumura means 
the story finally goes full throttle. This is when the story finally kicks into gear. And starts to be a major focus. Mm hmm and, and it's it's unfortunate because like like we said, like they could have easily paced this out a lot better, but this entire game is backloaded, you know? Um yeah. and and Okuma having a mental shutdown is really just the start of the story. And that's super late into the game, you know? Yeah. It essentially, like, for a main narrative, you go from the start seeing, like, oh, you were sold out and all this stuff, starting interrogation, and the flashback of what led to uh, uh, him being, uh, Ram being falsely charged sexual assault, or uh, just, just assault. <laughs> Because of Shido. Mm -hmm. You get very little from then up until Okumura. It's like the narrative was put on pause with very little things leaking out up until Okumura. Yeah. And. But I, I guess, you know, it, it's cool though, be, but at this point, you're finally getting story, right? like the real story and because yeah, at this the, point the characters aren't concerned with like oh we gotta find next target the booster of fame or whatever it's like oh god there, there's these shutdowns happening maybe we should deal with that <laughs> well it's it it's not even just the shutdowns the the thieves got framed for okumura yeah that that too so they're they're caught in a corner and they're not seemingly not left with any options yeah and uh, I guess that leads to the uh, next palace, right? Which is, it's finally back to the casino, which is none other than... Uh, and I really like how they reveal it. In, in game, right, you're constantly being brought back to the interrogation room whenever you meet a new confidant, or for story reasons, you're constantly being reminded about the interrogation room, right? So when you go back to there at oh, this you get point, these weapons. yeah, right. It's Sorry. like, who made you sandwiches? I, I, <laughs> I just wanted to point out the absurdity of that, like, the, her coming up with all these crazy assertions about you must have had these, this connection. Who was that person? Like, yeah, there didn't have to be this person here to win this. But okay, see, you're technically you're you are right. But you shouldn't have had to be. If if I can find the comic, I'll put it on screen or send it to you. I don't think I can find it, but I I've mentioned it before to you that there's a comic where it's like, you must have had something helping your mental health. What was it? What was it? Tell me. <laughs> and it just cuts back and Joker's petting a dog. <laughs> and it's yeah, like there's, there's like a there's like a mean picture of found Reddit of like. You kept saying hydrate. Who kept get, who got you water? Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, this is when the story kicks into gear. Things oh right. Are going really bad. <laughs> oh yeah, the the thieves are in a bad spot, right? So, at this point in the story, the thieves are blamed for the mental shutdowns, all time low for the story, right? And then come to discover, uh, when, when, you know, the arc wraps up, Sai, it, it goes back to the interrogation room and Sai is like, okay, well, you know, your next target, the most interesting one so far, Sai Nijima, myself. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, she like, like closes her notebook thing and she just pulls out the calling card. Yeah, she pulls out her oh. own calling card. Like, that's such a sick moment. Oh. I was like, oh, we went after you? <laughs> yeah. And like, and that's the thing, because she says your last target or your most recent target, which implies that it was the palace you were just in, right? Which yeah. was the casino. Why is Sai a fucking casino? Like, what? <laughs> like, Why was she a target? She's, and, she's and like, what led it all to here? Like, yeah. Yeah. And, and like, and it just, it goes through with the story, right? Like, it 
turns out like a Ak- catchy knows who you all yeah, are. Like we, <laughs> we, like we could have mentioned him sooner, but like he was this celebrity figure on a TV up to this point, uh, and a confidant. Um, a confidant exclusive just, to Royal, weirdly enough. Really weird. Um, uh, w- well, I should say I should say a confidant that you manually do is it, that's exclusive. In the original game, he was just part of the story. Uh, like just, every time you talk to him in the story, you would get ranks up, rank ups. Which doesn't make any sense. How does someone? How is just watching someone on TV increase your bond with them? Okay, whatever. okay, but you're not always watching him on TV. You're also interacting with him throughout the story. <laughs> okay, still. Like, but, but yeah, they they made it work, but like it was a set path. Whereas in Royal, you have to. They gave him a full storyline that you actually like interact with him. You know. Yeah, but uh, like he's seen as a celebrity figure, uh, the Ace Detective, um, and then at some point he's he's going against the fan themes. He's seen them as dangers to society and uh, because the fan theme's popularity is skyrocketing people turn on a catchy and he goes me to silent um and then uh it's like yeah you, he he comes to your school event and he reveals that he knows who you all are he knows that you're a fan thieves and he gives you an ultimatum uh Help him change Sai's heart with her palace, or uh, he'll reveal who you all are. Yeah. And he'll be kaput. And as part of that, it's also that once the spouse is done, you have to give up being a fan thieves. Mm-hmm. So you're made to be put in this situation where you have no option, and you have to do what he's saying to do. Oh, yeah. And, and it's like... It's, like, really cool because it, it really emphasizes the relationship that Akechi and Joker have where they're, like, they, they're frenemies, like, right? Like, it's... Rivals? Y- yeah, like, they're, they're rivals, right? But, like, it's it's that sort of storytelling where they emphasize that, you know, Akechi's not in this to be your friend, you know? He will rat you all out, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but yeah, I guess that leads to, uh, to, uh, Sai's Palace, which is, uh, the casino, baby. It's the flashiness, the, the spectacle of it all, right? And I have to say that this is one of my favorite palaces, just from, like, an aesthetic and a vibe. Uh, design-wise, I'm not, I'm not huge on it, like, in terms of level design, but, like, because a lot of the time you're spending it in back rooms, and, like, that's not cool <laughs> like, I, I, yeah. like I, I enjoy when you're on the casino floor right like that's way f- more fun and interesting um, but then you you also get the music hello can we talk about whims of fate and how great that fucking song is like yeah whew. and then when you go to uh, to uh, like the run to just get the treasure it's a different song. And it's actually, like, there's lyrics to it. What the fuck? It's really yeah. good. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, like, lyrical songs isn't the crazy part. It's the fact that it's a palace theme that, like, throws yeah. you for a loop. <laughs> yeah. Um, but... Y- yeah, they, they really hammer in, like, with this palace theme being lyrical, and... If you remember that this was the palace from the very beginning, like this is gonna be a very important part of the game and of the story. And I remember thinking, like, okay, I know at some point we're gonna catch up to the beginning of the game. When is that? <laughs> when is shit gonna happen? And it turns out it's like right at the end of the palace. Um, so you go, you go through the motions a bit. You have, you have a catchy on your team. He's a persona user, you find out. Um, uh, 
you go through it, and then you have to wait until the deadline to send the calling card. Mm -hmm. Which uh, is honestly a really cool gimmick. I like that a lot. Yeah, it builds up the t tension. Mm -hmm. um, so then you go in. Uh, you you fight uh, Sai, who doesn't... For most of the fight, she's not some crazy monster. She plays... Uh, she just Roulette. Plays Roulette. <laughs> and and at first you, you were like, oh, is this like the whole boss fight? And I was like, oh yeah, you're just, you know, cough, cough. You're, you know, just fighting her in the arena. Just don't hit her when she says not to. And okay, I guess. I guess. And then, <laughs> and then the real fight starts. <laughs> Where she's like <laughs> doing party wide, like gun damage to everybody. And you're just like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> where it's totally it's an actual fight but then it's over and uh that's when stuff really happens <laughs> like, <laughs> that's when the once... the plot happens <laughs> yeah so like as soon as you're out of that fight and you're done you're about to grab the treasure Futaro's like oh god there's suddenly a shit ton of shadow readings why are they here uh be really careful getting out of here. Mm -hmm. So they decide to split up. So this is the point where, from the beginning of the game, we're just as Joker trying to escape the palace. Yeah, exactly. Uh, You're acting as a distraction so the other thieves can escape with the treasure while Joker, you know, is distracting like, oh, hey, look at me. I'm in the palace. Ooh, wow, wow I'm the Phantom Thief, right? Like, yeah. uh, and it's... And, and like you said, you're basically replaying the beginning of the game again. Like you even do the same tutorial fight again, just with the the personas you've unlocked at this point, right? Yeah, which so. I I really love that they literally go through the same part from the beginning of the game. And it's mm -hmm. not like truncated or anything. It's the same thing. Yeah, exactly. And what's a cool touch? Uh, I I wanted to mention this briefly. At the beginning of the game, your party members chime in like. Hey Joker, you gotta get going or whatever, right? In the beginning of the game, all their portraits are blacked out, so you can't see their faces. But yeah. you can hear their like voices clearly. Point. Yeah. So it's like a little teaser for like you get to meet all your party members right away. But you know, when you're in this part of the game, all their faces are uncovered and you have the full story and the context of everything, right? So yeah. This is like a cool little now you know who's are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. You know who everyone is now. Um. So, you know by that point what the outcome is going to be. Right. Uh, you try to escape. It goes into an anime cutscene. Uh, Joker is running out. There's a ton of police everywhere. He tries <laughs> to escape going up a ladder. He falls and he's just caught. There's nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. and that's where you go to the interrogation and someone tells them you were sold out yep and it's like oh who the who the hell sold them out right but yeah. uh so at this point you're you're in the interrogation well, well i actually i'm kind of curious before we do anything what what were you thinking at this point did you did you have any idea what was going on like did you have any idea of like the plans or anything that were being executed? Uh, like I got the sense, uh, like oh they're take they're gonna take advantage of the fan thieves' popularity and then dispose of them to see you know, the good guys. Um, and I had a feeling, like. Akechi was the party member you spent the least amount of time with and he was like the only feasible <coughs> option to be the one who sold you out. Right. The other people first I thought was maybe Sojiro because there was that bounty put up for like oh you ride out the fantasy so get a ton of money. But Sojiro was such a good guy I couldn't imagine him doing that either. <laughs> um and then you find out. Um, so, like, uh, 
they put they drugged you when they stuck you in that room to make your memory hazy so you're leaving out key moments throughout the game uh, mm. and it's only towards the end of this interrogation that you're, everything's finally clear clearing up and you realize you remember who was that saw you out and you remember that you knew he was going to sell you out and that was a catchy and then all this crazy stuff, this whole elaborate plan, both from Akechi and from the fandom, so you still undermine Akechi, uh, went into motion, and you remember all of it, and then it and then it happens. Yeah, he, he, and then you get hashtag the dump, <laughs> where where, <laughs> where the where the fandom thieves basically they, they through this elaborate. Tell- Elaborate as plan, fake Joker's death, and <laughs> they straight up tell you before all this, like, "Hey, you should save now because you're not gonna get our chance for a while." Oh, that's right. Yeah, the game literally <laughs> warns you, like, "Hey, bud, if you want to go get a drink or something, or you want to go to bed for the night, save now because you're gonna be in here when you come back." <laughs> 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 yeah. So, like. Now that you finally remember everything that was going on, remember you you uh you have you finally gain this little bio trust with Sai. Um you tell her to grab your phone and show it to a catchy when he comes by. Mm-hmm. Uh and then a little effect happens. Might realize at the time what happened. I didn't catch on right away. Then he walks into the room, and he shoots you. <laughs> and then I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> uh, and then, it, and then they reveal this whole elaborate thing of... So there was this scene way earlier in the game. Uh, I think when they are in the back of the TV station. Um, when they were... It was just like... Uh, a cat, uh, it was a... Uh, Ren, Ryuji, An, and Morgana. I forget if Ryusuke was there at that point. Or just like in that scene, I don't think he was. Um, but they were just chilling, talking about stuff, and Morgana brings up uh, getting delicious pancakes. And they all like agreed to that idea. But Morgana just doesn't want to talk about pancakes. And uh, right. there, there's this little story thing in the game about you can uh, in the real world, Morgana is just a cat. And you only hear him meowing. The only way you can understand what he's actually saying is if you were in the metaverse and you heard him. Mm-hmm. That's the only way you're understanding what he's saying. Right. So then in that scene, a catchy walks by and he says, Oh, I thought I heard someone mention delicious pancakes. But Morgana was the only one that said that. So how does he... How did he hear that? Mm. At the beginning of the game, no less. It wasn't early. Yeah. It wasn't like earlier in the month or something. It was a long time ago, right? Like way before yeah. you, you even did the palace stuff. I think it's before Madarame, actually. So Yusuke wasn't in Maybe. the party yet. So like the yeah. fact the fact that Kechi caught it, that is your one key clue about Akechi not being trustworthy. That's And it's goddamn pancakes of all things <laughs> there's a there's a reason it's uh there's many a memes about his downfall being pancakes <laughs> the amount of memes i sent you after the pancake scene was so good <laughs> <laughs> it was all great so then from there you you recall all these moments of trying with morgana and futaba this trap with a catchy that you'd have Futaba look into him and she grabs his foot at one point and is made to look at the moment like she's just being weird and obsessing over this phone. But in reality, she's installing an app on there. <laughs> T- to like track his conversations and stuff. Yeah. Uh, so then they hear his plan to... Uh, to, to kill him after the palace. So, 
they hatched his plan, so they notice when you're in the metaverse and certain parts of it, it'll look the exact same as in the real world if it's not part of the the distortion. Uh, like in um, like they bring up when they first stepped into the metaverse, Ren and Ryuji. They didn't notice they were in the metaverse until they saw Kamoshida's castle. The rest of the past up to that point when they just thought they were going to school looked the exact same. Because right. none of that mattered to Kamoshida. It wasn't mm -hmm. part of his distortion. Mm -hmm. So, with Sai in that area, uh, they investigated <laughs> uh, the interrogation room that they found out he was going to be sent to and found out that it looked the exact same as in the metaverse uh, that did in the real world. So they set up this trap so that they would have uh, Sai show Kessie the phone, uh, which <laughs> does this little effect, which brings him into the metaverse. So he's not shooting Ren, he's shooting... Uh, the cognition of Ren. Right. Which is brilliant and wild and crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to explain the rest of it? Because I can't, probably can't keep it all straight. <laughs> all the details of it. So, so es essentially, what the deal is, right, is that Akechi kills the cognitive Ren in the fake world, while the real Ren meets up with Sai to leave uh and yeah she gets a text from from Akihara Akihara Akimaru whatever it was Alibaba uh, from, from Alibaba I was thinking of the town area um oh Akihabara <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh aka Futaba to tell her to go check on Rent to get him out of there before mm -hmm. the whole thing is discovered and ruined Right. And uh and like the the whole the whole plan like Sai walks up to the garden is like, "Hey, you should run now cuz you're going to get busted and like the people you're working for, they're just going to kill you anyway." And and the guard's like, "Oh, I'm fucking out of here. <laughs> Bye." <laughs> like uh yeah. And then like uh so it's announced on the news, oh, the Phantom Thief Killer committed suicide, right? Because Akechi thinks he killed him, right? Uh, and it shows all the Phantom Thieves, like, at different parts in their lives, acting completely normal as if nothing's different, right? And then they're all seeing the news of Ren, quote-unquote, committing suicide, right? Uh, yeah, and at and the time, they act shocked. Yeah, at first you think they're they're all like, <gasps> but then at the very end when you all when you see all of their reactions at the very end it zooms in on Ryuji's mouth and he snickers and he's like we got him and I'm like yes <laughs> let's go so fucking hype <laughs> it's like this these group of teenagers come up with this elaborate plan to fake a suicide. Which is insane to outsmart a, a, a supposed ace detective and then get this fugitive back home. <laughs> it's just, it's so wild and crazy, and I love it. it it's, it's, a, it's this massive plot dump that takes a month. <laughs> it feels so good seeing how much you you messed up a catchy in their plans. Oh, yeah. Like, the, the whole. Okay, that one segment of Persona 5 is like, is what I live for in Ace Attorney games. I love when the tables are turned. That shit is so hype for me. Like, I just, oh god, it's so yeah. good. You uh, go from this this major low point of the story going, like, oh god, what's gonna happen? How are we gonna get out of this? To, hell yeah, we outsmarted the detective. We're on top of the world. We're gonna show them who's boss. <laughs> and and that's the thing is in the in the context of the story, they think the villains and Akechi think you're still dead. 
So, like, you have to lay low, but you totally tricked them, and you're you're getting ready to like to turn it back on them. You know, like yeah, it's such a cool moment. I love it so much. I love that even that that even bleeds into just your normal social stuff because you have to like uh, you have your hood up, and I think the music's different while you're shuffling around. Mm -hmm. And when you try to go to the school, you you're just like. At the entrance, like in an alleyway, you're just like asking why I teleport either to a rooftop or hang out with Makoto. Yeah, it, it basic it basically tries to minimize how much like physical time you're spending in the building. Yeah. It's just it's just so brilliant and uh very very well handled the whole part of the game. You know, yeah. Like, like the the way the game the story was paced that it's like you get nothing and then everything all at once so it, it sucks that you're just waiting for the story to happen and then you suddenly get all of it mm -hmm. but on the other hand it's so satisfying the way things play out oh yeah definitely like like i said earlier they can def if you change some things around the pacing would be better but like the payoff for all that waiting, it almost, almost feels worth it, you know? Like, yeah, it's not quite worth it, but, like, it's so good, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It feels so fucking good. Uh, and then, uh, I, you know, like, after, after that, right, like, you, you uh, in story, Ren and the Phantom Thieves explain the whole plan to Sai and Sojiro, and they're, you know, obviously, they try their best to understand, mostly Sojiro, he tries, right? But, like, but overall, like, the the story kind of takes, not a, 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 it doesn't slow down, per se, but it becomes about, like, trying to figure out, okay, so who was the one that instigated all this right uh and uh long story short they find out that akechi through who he was talking to on his phone he was talking to uh the candidate for prime minister shido and it's it's officially at the point in the game where you know, you know who the villain is. You know yeah. who screwed Ren over at the beginning of the game, like before the game even started. And yeah. now, you... and and now this dude's running for prime minister, and he's talking some crazy shit about changing the country. Like you got to make that shit stop. You know, yeah. like it, you, it's a big deal. You have not. You have an idea from the start. Like, I see this guy that fucked you over, and the fact that. He has the police under his thumb, meaning he has some crazy level of authority over them. Mm -hmm. And then you find out, yeah, he's going to be running for Prime Minister. And because of all the crazy shit he's done, uh, people are rooting for him. And if you don't intervene, they will vote him into being Prime Minister. And then the country is going to go to shit. <laughs> uh -huh. Like, I love that literally his palace is on a ship while seeing the entire rest of Japan, like, uh, in ruins. Mm hmm Like, only his select few are allowed to live in luxury while everyone else suffers. Yep, it's, it's, it's another one of those moments where, like, as cool as the casino was, like, I understood the connection they were trying to make between size you know, view of, the, like, the courthouse, right, and everything. And, like, I understand Okumura, like, wanting to, like, travel to Utopia, right, through outer space. But Shido's and the Ark, like, literally the song is called Ark that plays on the ship. It It's such, like, a perfect, like... I like it's exactly it's exemplifying what 
he is. He thinks he's the savior, right? Like, he's yeah. going to steer Japan and rule over them. And, and he's the deciding factor in everything, right? Like, it's so fucked up, right? Um, and and like and like we said earlier, the the Phantom Thieves are believed to be disbanded at this point by the villains and Akechi, right? They think they think all like they have no reason to believe that they're in any sort of trouble, right? So you know, as you go through the palace, you get little scenes where you know, you get one scene where Akechi's on like a talk show and someone's phone goes off and then Akechi's just like, wait a minute. A phone, like, and then he remembers that Sai showed him that phone, and he's like, "Oh, fu I fucked up." Like, <laughs> I, I, I'm a little out down. They didn't have, they didn't instead have a scene of him, like, just seeing them alive. They're like, "Oh shit!" Right mm -hmm. there, <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Just that that kind of realization, but it still works. Like him. Just really piecing it together in the real world. Yeah. And like... Oh, and then, you know, you go through the whole palace on the Ark, right? Collecting the letters and everything. What did, what did you think of the uh, Shido's palace, the Ark? Uh, probably one of the best, I would say. Oh, wow. One of the better ones. I listened to that music, uh, the Ark. Uh, that that might be like the best uh, palace theme. In the game. Oh, it's so good! It's so good! It, it's so good as like the final dungeon, the final palace theme, at least to the base game. Mm -hmm. Um, and like you're kind of getting at like like the space station and the casino are really flashing the spectacle, and it's really cool, but they're not exactly like intimidating places compared to a ship going through a, a, a country in ruins, or even going back to the first palace, where the castle in place of the school. Those are really, like, the two most, like, terrifying, intimidating palace designs, probably. Mm -hmm. Because the rest are just like, oh, they make sense for the ruler. Oh, a museum, a bank, whatever. I mean, the okay, the bank floating above the city is really cool. And, like, all of humanity are just ATMs. <laughs> like, that was really yeah. funny. <laughs> yeah. But I love that, uh... Like, I was wondering, like, what could the design of the palace be for a last one, for the, the final... Uh, for the final one, the final roller. And it's really cool. It's like this luxury cruise ship going around Japan. Uh... You know, just... just all ruins again. Um, and when you're collecting these letters of uh, recommendation or uh, letters, uh, invitation of us, you're going to these like CEOs and these high profile people that you find out have connections to these past events, like the person who put up the Medjed uh, threat, or you find out that. Kashir was funneling money to Cheeto and all this stuff. And it's just really cool to find out all these connections that were leading back up to the main villain. Mm hmm. I always, I always love that shit in games when it's like, oh, but it's all connected at the very end. Yeah. <laughs> uh,. Yeah. And when you beat the last guy, the last guy doesn't even want to fight you. He's just like, eh, whatever. It's not worth it. Goodbye. Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then a catchy shows up and he's like, you fucking bastards. <laughs> like, yeah, and this is where you see like his true get up. Yeah. Like, so oh, he's, he's like Joker where he could hold multiple persona personas. He has two. But it's not just that he he like he changed his appearance to be a facade to when he met with, he was working with the fan thieves. Right, like his true nature is that of a trickster like Joker, but whereas Joker was able to build up bonds and 
you know, harvest a lot of power to, you know, create multiple personas and stuff like that. Akechi never bonded with anyone, so he was only able to create uh, two personas, right? Uh, and, like, it's always interesting when modern Persona games play with the idea of a character having multiple personas. Um, they, they do play with the idea, um, but, like... It's always weird for me because, like, as a classic Persona fan, all the characters in the classic games could use multiple Personas. So, so like, it when they treat it as, like, a super unique and special thing in the modern games, I'm just like, yeah, but is it, you know? Like, but is it? <laughs> uh, I, I kind of like how it is here because, at least given how Persona 5 works in the game, the combat, if everyone could swap out several Personas, that would be chaos that would be so overwhelming with all those options <laughs> see like. yeah that's true but at the same time it would be really cool if each character could like for example if you max out their confidant they get two personas right and, and then joker his whole gimmick is that he can have three or four so like yeah okay. y you you get what i mean like it's what if it was like the the personas that joker has access to what if you just spread out those numbers between the party you know what I mean? And, like... Because yeah. that's exactly what the classic games did. They just... Each character could only have, like, two or three personas. And you... And, like, each character had different affinities with different personas. So, like, some were more effective with others. You know, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. But, but like... It also and, works the way this game did it. Where no, oh, they yeah. Have it, one, it, it works fine yeah. as is. Yeah. They have one persona that represents their character and... That one person will set those skills, and those, those are the reasons you'd want to have them in your party or not. Yeah. Um, and but uh, given given the nature of the persona is the way they explain the game, it makes sense that most people would only have one, and that you're very special about more than one, if you would like. Yeah, it makes sense in the modern series, but like, it, it's just always funny when they treat it like a big special thing when it's. You know, right before Persona 3, it was never really a special thing. I guess it's special to have eight or more, but it's not special to have, like, multiples in of itself. <laughs> yeah. But, and, but anyway. Uh, <clears throat> back on track. Um, Akechi reveals that he was the one with the black mask the whole time who's been traveling in palaces and... Uh, creating mental shutdowns and stuff like that, right? Yeah. I was thinking, like, okay, so, you know, before that point, you could probably put together, or if it wasn't outright stated, like, he was still going around and causing all those shutdowns. I was like, wait, the describe was a black mask. Did he, did he, like, spray paint his mask or something? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> he, yeah, because before that, when he's in his phantom thief outfit so to speak it's uh a red mask with white clothing yeah <laughs> where is his dark where is his dark mask is a is uh, a blue suit with black mask you know like yeah it's it's the opposite of <laughs> of white and red you know yeah and they he's like especially when you have him in the third semester and his pee is pure bloodlust. <laughs> oh, yeah. He, this is where the character breaks. This is where he goes all out and what he's really like. How the whole thing about being an ace detective was a, was a facade and all everything. <laughs> you learn his... The reason he's doing everything is to impress Shido, who's actually his father. Mm. Um... And all all for a chance at revenge. Yeah. And then you find out after the fight that from the cognitive Akechi that he was going to dispose of him regardless. Right. He didn't mean anything to Shido. Mm hmm He was going to dispose of him the same way he was disposing of all the other high profile connections he had. Just for yeah. just to get rid of the slightest uh like Possible. like bit like the money trail basically he wanted to get rid of it all yeah he wanted to get rid of any slightest uh cause of uh of an obstacle of opposition 
and uh, what did you think of the uh, the Akechi boss fight? Uh, it was interesting fighting a Persona user because you hadn't really done that at all up to that point. Mm -hmm. um, especially fighting someone who was on your team, but he's using a different Persona now, so you don't know his moves anymore. Um, right. I think you, you fight him in two other shadows, I think it was. Yes. So, yeah. Um, it wasn't as crazy as, like, an actual, like, Palace ruler, ruler boss fight, but it was, uh, it was a very fun encounter uh, fighting this person who betrayed you and was actually out to dispose of you the whole time. Yeah. I don't remember the fight itself being that particularly memorable outside of fucking debilitate being awful used against you. Oh yeah, debilitate oh. sucks, dude. <laughs> uh dealing with that was awful, but otherwise it was you know, it was a somewhat standard uh mini boss encounter. Yeah. Uh and then uh and then we get to the real fight because after you beat a catchy and Akechi is like, he basically sacrifices himself for the Phantom Thieves to get away, right? Um, yeah. And, and like, that's fucked up, right? And then, like, and Futaba confirms, you know, he's gone, right? Uh, and then you uh, skip ahead, right? You send the calling card to Shido, but the calling card which is... is... Which, the calling card is not just a calling card... They literally broadcast it nationally. They broadcast themselves alive and well, and the leader goes up to the camera and is like, we're taking your heart. <laughs> like, it is such a cool moment. You, like, I fucking... Like, there's there's a part where, like, the, the movie studio... The TV studio is like, quick, shut them down! And, like, they start going offline, and Futaba's like, hmm too bad i win <laughs> and then hits one button and then the whole country every tv station in the country becomes the phantom thieves broadcast literally cannot not see it you know so yeah. everyone knows the phantom thieves are not only back but they're here to take shido down because he's a lying sack of shit <laughs> yeah it is usually one of the hypest points of the game mm-hmm just seeing them on that grand scale talking down to their next target. We will get you. <laughs> mm -hmm. We are here and we are after you. We will steal your heart. <laughs> and then, like, Shido gets his band of fucking cronies together and they're like, we gotta figure out how to stop them or else. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh. It is cool seeing a ruler like they, like, because of him stealing uh, Mutala's mom's research. And someone else's research. <laughs> uh, he knows how it works, and that they're going how they're going to change his heart. Uh, so they're trying to wrap uh, uh, crazily like find a way to stop that. <laughs> I, just, I love that part of it. Mm -hmm. Like he gets this whole plan together where like he's gonna wait for the phantom thieves to try and steal his heart and before they could steal uh his treasure right um he's going to like basically self-induce uh, a coma more or less right and that'll kill them because he'll be functionally dead right um yeah it, it, it's this like liquid uh medicine that he takes and the effect it has on Metaverse is it destroys his ship. So yep. they have to take the treasure and get the fuck out. <laughs> <laughs> so, what did you think of Shadow Shido's boss fight overall? A very good, <laughs> a really, really good final boss encounter. Uh, I love that the first phase was him just on, right on top of the of uh, the ignorant masses, as they refer to them. Mm -hmm. uh, 
bring um pushing him up holding him up uh as like the ruler or whatever it's like a really cool yeah. visual thing right yeah and then after that he's <laughs> he's like a fucking anime villain at that point. oh <laughs> yeah and, and, yeah he becomes and fucking it's... buff boy like <laughs> let's go <laughs> like he's out of fucking like dragon ball or some shit yeah right and and so, so, at this point, he finally recognizes who Ren was. That this was the dipshit that he ruined his life all that time ago. Yeah. <laughs> and, and like, have... it's it's so cool. Like, so like mechanically, what did you think of the fight? Oh, it was it was, it was so nice. It's, it's so tense. Uh, like that last phase, we were using uh, items to constantly lower his, all his stats. <laughs> well, at least being the shit out of Ren, because the last phase with he says "fuck you" to all your other party members is just Ren. Mm -hmm. Uh so you're just trying to survive. <laughs> uh it's it's great. I loved it. <laughs> you're just so trying to constantly keep your health up, lower his stats, and wail on him as much as you can when you have the chance. Right, it's like a really cool, like tense fight, because like even if you're really good stat wise, uh, you can actually get kind of fucked up in that fight when you get to the Ren only phase, because you have to focus on healing yourself, you know. So you yeah. you got to make sure you're prepared for that kind of thing, right? And we were for the most part, right? But like, yeah, it was definitely tense, right? Yeah, if you didn't think to have uh a healer focus persona on Joker and you only relied on like Morgana at that point, you're fucked. I imagine <sighs> you'd be fucked at that point. Uh cause then you just have to rely on how many HP items you have. Right. Uh, so yeah, that part was really tense. <laughs> but Oh, you know, uh real quick, what did you think of uh the instrumental theme Rivers in the Desert? What did you think of it? Oh, that was so good. I love Rivers in the Desert. I'm so mad it's not in Smash. <laughs> that and fucking what Life Will Change. Yeah, okay. What makes and Life Will Change... And they the reveal trailer. Yeah, Life Will Change was in the reveal trailer. Why, why wasn't it in Smash? <laughs> yes, that, that music is so fucking good. When you're fighting Shido, the Rivers in the Desert, it's like the... It's like the the big big time uh, boss encounter music. Oh yeah. It's it's so fucking hype and grandiose. And I loved it so much. Yeah, it's so good. But uh, yeah. so I I guess narrative wise, right? Uh, you beat Shadow Shido, and uh, you take the treasure, and you start running, right? But then. Shido in real life knows that you're about to take the treasure, so he takes the the medication to you know basically induce a coma and kill himself, right? And uh, that the palace is falling apart, it's sinking because it's a ship, right? And like, oh, there's a lifeboat yeah. over there, but we need to get over to the other end of the boat. And then Ryuji, in the number one like character arc moment, makes a fucking comeback. He's like. He, he readies up like he's at a track meet, and, it, and he starts going for it, and it's like, he really... It's he, so fucking cool. Yeah, and he, he fucking gets the switch, and the boat falls, and then he fucking explodes, because the boat is sinking, and everyone else makes it out, and they take the treasure, and everyone's like, where the fuck is Ryuji? What happened to Ryuji? He, like, he... Like, he died. And then... Oh, it's never mind. He comes in from off screen. It's very silly. It's very funny. It's cute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, so one one thing I just thought of, like, so how it worked in the previous palaces? Maybe I'm dumb and I missed some detail about this. So, in the other palaces, you know, you you beat the boss, you take the treasure, and the palace starts vanishing. As we're all taking the treasure, so right. like in the in Futala's palace, the pyramid starts crumbling apart and whatever it starts, or the palace starts it starts falling apart, whatever. Uh huh. 
what's the difference really compared to him taking so, the medication and doing that himself? Because like it was gonna fall apart regardless. This scene. Well, okay. So the difference was here that when Shido kills himself, the entire metaverse collapses. So it's not just the palace. Uh, it's it's right. everything around it is collapsing within the metaverse. So he's trying to seal off their exit, more or less. That's the idea there. Yeah. So he's bas not, he's basically yeah. trapping them in the metaverse, and they would die. But are they still gouge just by getting to a lifeboat? Yeah, they they uh, they're lifeboat. conveniently yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So then, uh, you know, Shido has his change of heart, right? And he admits to all his crimes and everything like that. And it's revealed, oh, S Sai, you know, goes up to Ren and is like, hey, the only way we're going to bust this guy is if we get your testimony on this, right? Like, and you have no, like, you will be arrested for this, but Shido is stopped, right? Like, you saved the world by doing this, right? And then, yeah. out of fucking nowhere, Akechi shows up. And Akechi's like, no, I'll I'll fucking do it. And it's like, bro, we detect we knew you didn't have a, like a heartbeat anymore. What the fuck happened, right? Like yeah. and, and, and he's just like, you know, I'm I'm here now. Like that's that's it. Wait. Like I'll I'll uh I think you're well, skipping ahead. Well yeah, I'm skipping ahead because I <laughs> I have to go to bed at some point. We've been talking for three hours. So I Okay. I, what, All right. did, Wait, did, what did I miss? What did I miss? The entire mementos thing and the god control. No, that's not this isn't, part. No, this wait, is... isn't... No, Isn't Kessie is, reappearing after all that? No. Because then it comes back to... Is it... Is it not? Because then you see... Oh. Shit. Uh, the people... Are still gonna vote for him. They don't recognize what the fan thieves did. So then they're like, "Oh fuck! Did that even matter?" So then they go to the Mentos and all that stuff happens. And it's only after that that they're able to properly dispose of Shido. Is that is that real? Am I getting my events mixed up? I think you are. Also because of the, how the third semester starts. I guess if I don't know, I I fucked up. I guess I'm I don't know. Are you okay? No, I I'm I swore that's what happened, but okay. Maybe I'm wrong, but no wait. No, I think you're right because that's when the Christmas scene happens, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you're right. Yep. <laughs> I just get my I got the events out of order. I'm sorry. Um. Anyway. You go ahead. Then. You're fine. Yeah, so you take down Shido, who's like the big bad up to this point, and uh, no one acknowledges it. No one acknowledges he had a change of heart. Everyone is still questioning the fan thief's legitimacy, which seems really weird at this point. So then you come to the conclusion after a bit, like, what the fuck is going on? How did taking out Shido not solve this? We changed his heart. Everyone saw that. <laughs> but there's, it's still not going to do anything. They're just going to put someone else in front of the seat. That'll be just bad. And right. nothing will happen because uh, the people will vote for them. Um, so then they come to the conclusion that they have to go through Mentos because that's the palace of the people. That's the, their collective uh, cognition. And right. if they can change the the heart of the masses, then they'll finally be able to properly deal with Shido and get him convicted. And now have to worry about it. And then that's where suddenly another major threat comes out of nowhere and... Oh, right. weird itself. Right. So when you find when you get to the depths of Mementos, that's literally the palace name. I real real talk real quick. I want to mention like anytime in a 
like an RPG or a video game or whatever that you're in like the depths of w whatever. Like it, it just sounds so cool. Like it, you're like you're you're like going into the dark place, right? Like this is the sinister zone, right? But you you get to the depths of society's heart, right? Where what you know humanity searches for, and it turns out that you know. Throughout the palace, you're getting small hints about, like, you know, where, like, Morgana came from, right? And, like, like yeah, what... Yeah, because that was something hidden at throughout the game. Like, mm -hmm. he wants to be human because that's what he thinks he is or should be. But he has amnesia. He doesn't know anything about his past. And then a couple a couple times throughout the game, you see this glimpse of, like, a shadow Morgana. What looks to be a shadow Morgana. And, like, what's going on with him? And then this is where you start to gain that answer. Right. You start getting the answers to this, right? But when you reach the depths of Mementos, you you find out that the treasure of society is none other than the Holy Grail. Like, the literal, like, the ultimate treasure, right? Like, what King Arthur and his band of fucking rogues <laughs> looked for. <laughs> like, yeah. it... It's it's everlasting life. It's freedom. It's security. You know, like it's it's society feels safe when they have, you know, their wishes granted that they are everything's okay, they right? They don't have to think. They don't have to worry about anything. They mm -hmm. just relax in the prison of their own making, literally. Cor correct. And so you start fighting. The Holy Grail because it well, fucking uh, talks to you, well, right? Like, hold, hold on. So, before you get there, even like in one of the big cell rooms, you even see like the rulers, the little palace rulers in there. You see, like, so I guess when they were corrupted, when their hearts were destroyed, they left Mementos and formed their own palace. Mm -hmm. And because you dealt with them, they came back to the depths of Mementos. Right. I thought that was that was a really cool detail about it. Oh, you you know what? That's a good point. Contextualizing it, it, that. Yeah, it it shows you that like if you forcefully change the hearts of people, they're all going to wind up in a place like this, right? And so. Yeah. Now, where someone naturally changing their heart is a lot more, it's just better, right? Like it's healthier, right? That's the idea behind it, right? If you force change on people it's not healthy right uh so that's like a a really cool detail i appreciated too um so you find the holy grail right and uh the holy grail speaks to you and says hey you can't stop me i'm literally what the masses want like everyone wants what is the holy grail which is not having to think for themselves you know like not everlasting happiness, so to speak, but not having to think about the hardships of life, you know? Like, yeah. Uh, and. Pure ignorance. Yeah. Ignorance is bliss, literally. Like, that's what society wishes for. Uh, like, on a subconscious level. And. Uh, so, you know, all the Phantom Thieves are like, yo, fuck that. That sucks. Like, I, I enjoy thinking for myself and, like, being able to strive for my own goals in life, you know? Like, I don't want to be chained down by some fucking cup, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and Holy Grail's like, I bet. <laughs> like, so... All right, try to stop me. You can't. Right. So he says, you know, try to stop me. And, uh... And so you fight the Holy Grail, and every time you do enough damage to it, it just, you know, the masses scream at you. They're like, no, stop, don't, don't do this, we want this, like, damn. And the fan thieves are like, what the fuck? Like, what, what's going on? And in the gameplay... And as well as all, yeah. And as oh. well, in the, in the fight, that it fully restores his health. Right. So you can't do anything to him. Right. Every dam every bit of damage you deal gets healed back ten times over. So Yeah. <laughs> and 
and then stuff really, really hits the fan. <laughs> mm, go for it. Go for it. Tell me about it. What's up? <laughs> so, uh, he's like the ultimate goal of the God of Control is merging the metaverse and mentos with the real world. Uh, which is terrifying. The sky turns red. There's like these giant fossil like things appearing out of the out of nowhere. It's it's like the apocalypse. It's literally the apocalypse. But that's the and thing, just... because it's what society wishes for on a subconscious level. They don't react to any of it. They see like yeah. blood raining from the sky and don't blink an eye. Yeah. And as part of it, because it's still part of Mementos, because it's what the their, the masses' cognition, the fantasies disappear because they don't see them. Hmm. Because they, they're not the, part of their cognition. Yeah, they don't believe in them anymore. Yeah. It's like the, <laughs> when you put it that way, it's like a fucking Santa Claus story. Well, it, it literally is that, though, because... <laughs> Yeah. Because the masses on a subconscious level forgot about the Phantom Thieves. Uh, you have to the, believe again. The Phantom Thieves literally in a cutscene visually start disappearing before their very eyes. Yeah. <laughs> what did you think of that scene, by the way? Um, It was horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Seeing everyone just vanish. It was like, oh god, what the fuck? What's going on? <laughs> so then you're brought to the Velvet Room. Yep. After everyone, that... after everyone watches each other disappear into the ether, Ren wakes up in the Velvet Room. <laughs> yeah. You wake up there. Igor uh, decides that you have lost the game, and he orders the twins to execute you. And so you get into a little fight with them where you're scripted to lose. Uh, but you help them realize that this is not what they're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. So instead of executing you, you execute the twins. In a uh, manner similar to how you execute uh, persona uh, personas. So you execute them, they come back as one whole, as Lavenza. And you find out that what you thought has been Igor this whole time was actually the God of Control. Mm -hmm. Lee Yuan is his prisoner of, him, of himself that you've been watching this whole time. And seeing everything that's been unfolding is just some game to him. Yep. He's been, like, sort of just testing humanity, but he considers it all a game. He, he was rigging it from the start. You know, like it, it, it's it's a totally cool moment, and like as a longtime Persona fan, getting that huge reveal of, I guess Igor being the villain was like super tight, right? Like, yeah, because like Igor is not a villain character; he's always helpful. But the Igor in this game, with his dark, sinister voice, and like you know. Like all that, all that shit, right? It's, it's not even it. It's like surprise, it wasn't even Igor to begin with, right? Like that's just such yeah. a cool thing. So then, yeah, you find out Igor was the god of control this whole time. You set the real Igor free. Uh, the god of control fucks off, <laughs> and the you go around less. the belt. <laughs> yeah. Um, then you go around this arrow outside of the Velvet Room, encouraging your teammates to get up, uh, light up their rebellious spirit, as it were, and join you, uh, convince them that everything was for a purpose, and that you can still, uh, fight this, uh, would-be god. Hmm. And it's, it's so cool. So you yeah. leave the Velvet Room, you find out that this giant door in the Death of Mentos that supposedly held a criminal was you, 
because it was the bubble room and it was like entrenched in mental because of like out of control. Mm -hmm. And then you get this crazy sequence of going up to this tower where the god of control is residing on this on these like uh bones or whatever they are leading up to him. You fighting his like guardians. And then you fight the god of control. And it's so insane. So real quick, I love that the entire time you're running up to where the God of Control resides now, life will change is playing. Like it is oh, such yeah. it is such a cool way to tie that back into the whole thing of like never backing down. Like you might think we're down and out, but we're gonna fight you and we're gonna kick your ass, bud. Like we're coming for you. Like it's such a cool hype song, and it like it's yeah. such a cool moment. I love that. And then you fight the god of control, and it's really fucking hard because he's an asshole. <laughs> he brings out these weapons that symbolize the uh, like the seven sins. Mm -hmm. uh, after a point, after a while of trying to fight him. You can't, but as you're fighting him, the the masses are waking up, and they're realizing what the fuck is going on, <laughs> and <laughs> start rooting for the Phantom Thieves. And because, because of that, you're they can yeah. hear like when the Phantom Thieves become so rebellious, they're able to essentially channel themselves to the masses, and the masses are like, wait a minute, like. I don't want this crazy shit that's going on, right? Like, <laughs> like I, 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 we need help, you know? Like, put us back on the right path, and everyone starts rooting for the Phantom Thieves, you know? And it's a really epic moment, right? And then they build up this gigantic fucking persona because of the the masses' hopes and uh, ambitions. Mm -hmm. That just kills, that just shoots the god of control in the face. That's it's such crazy. a cool scene. I love it. <laughs> it's oh, so fucking good. Can we talk about that one little cool bit where when everyone's cheering for the Phantom Thieves, you see the meter saying, do you believe in the Phantom Thieves raising oh, up yeah. and up and up? And it's like, oh, let's go. <laughs> and this is another thing, like, this and... Uh, there's a scene like after you're presumed dead where you see all the confidence you do, it built up comes like support you and then here as they're, you're like gaining their support you see the confidence again like uh, like rooting for you and telling you to not back down it's, it's just so cool mm -hmm. I love that you get these like little cutscenes of the confidence rooting for you as another little bonus of backing them out. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I guess we should also clarify, the only confidant you didn't do was the fortune teller, right? Every other confidant yeah. you maxed out, so. Well, and, and the twins slash Lavenza. But yeah, oh, those true. are the only two. Right, right. So I did everything, all the confidants that were worthwhile. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, but yeah, and then, you know, you beat the God of Control, everything returns to normal, right? And society moves on as if it never happened, yeah. right? Um. And that's, and that's more or less where the base game ended, I guess. Or if you didn't meet certain requirements up to this point. Um, right. I also want to mention, uh, as cool as the old God of Control and the mental and stuff is, it felt like a straight, like, left turn after dealing with Cheeto. <laughs> Fair. Because suddenly, from going from, you know, this, so, oh, suddenly there's this giant, the fucking god, that deals with from the depths of Mementos. And, like, up to this point, I know there were teases of, like, Morgana and stuff, but I honestly thought that Mementos was going to be an entirely optional dungeon <laughs> up to this point. It's like, mm. oh, nope, it's... It's uh, part of the story. Now, all of a sudden. <laughs> well, that's the thing, right? Is they they heavily hint you should get to the end of Mementos. They tease you, like, what's at the end, you know? Yeah, but... 
maybe it was just me, but I thought it was still, even with those seasons, I thought it was some optional thing and not as big it went, as big an important thing as it was. Hmm. I see. And then you go from the only reason you go into the mental is to change the condition of the masses, so that Shido can actually be convicted. To lighter fighting a god to save the world. <laughs> <laughs> it's just yeah. it feels like such a turn, and it it at, everything after a turn is done really well. It's just it still feels like such a weird and straight <laughs> right turn to take after like. Who was the main tagger up to that point? Right, that's fair. The third semester is also a bit of a turn, but it's, I feel like it's, just, it's better hinted at. Hmm, that's fair. So, <laughs> uh, I guess in the story now, everything's back to normal, right? Uh, you know. All your party members are like, let's call it for the day, right? And Asai goes up to Joker and is like, hey, um, we can convict Shido, but we can't just do it alone. We need testimony. And we're going to need your testimony for that, right? And, but here's the deal. You'll be arrested for that, right? So, Joker is like, well, you know, I have to take, I have to take one for the team, right? That makes sense. But then, fucking Akechi shows up as if, and it's like, what the fuck? You never died? Like, what, what happened? <laughs> like, and Akechi's just like, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Like, I'm here now, and I can take the L for, for this whole Shido business, right? Like, and you're like, what yeah. the? What he's the? He's gonna turn himself in. He's gonna confess to everything. Right. Like, wow. Thanks. <laughs> uh, cool, I guess. Uh, and then, um, and then, and then Joker just, as he's like going home, you know, if if you're dating someone, you get like a cute Christmas scene, which is nice, right? Uh, but then you got all this fun like celebrating celebratory stuff with the team. Yeah, exactly. And then and it's you, all you... happening, everything, and then it fast forwards a little. Yeah, and then it fast forwards. It's New Year now, and like Joker just like wakes up, and then all of a sudden, just like the entire world is different. <laughs> like yeah. the first immediate thing is Morgana is a human, uh, and Futaba's mother is alive. Oh uh, yeah, like, what yeah. What the fuck is going on? And you're the only one that seems to be out of the loop here. Everyone else is acting like it's completely normal at this point. Right, exactly. Also, just say, this entire, like, post-game part of it is exclusive to Royal, and you can only get to it, apparently, by maxing out a few confidants. Yep, exactly. That are integral to this part of the story. Akechi, Kasumi, and Maruki. Yeah, so, uh, actually, uh, I will say, a Akechi's Confidant is not required to reach this part of the game, but oh, you do get I a, it was. but you get the bonus at the very end of the credits if you max his out, so, oh, okay. you should probably do that, <laughs> uh, yeah. but yeah, so, like, everything is, like, weird now, and you're, like, trying to figure out what the fuck is going on, and then, you know, Akechi shows up and he's alive still, <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. and like everyone in their life is happy now, right? Like, like Shiho and An are totally cool. Ryuji's on the track team and he's chilling with his homies, right? Like, uh, like it's it's a craziness, right? And then yeah, it's uh, it's it's kind of thing where it's just like this utopia all of a sudden. And the the suddenness of it and how perfect it is really off putting. And you're like, something because of how perfect it is off, it should not be as perfect. What is going on? Right. Like it's literally like life is not sunshine and rainbows, you know? Like it can't be yeah. this happy. It's it's wild, right? 
Um, and then you find out Akechi's alive, and he's like, here's the deal. Like, I this is all fucked up and weird. Like, the things shouldn't be like this, right? Yeah. So, so he's he, very pissed at you. Yeah, and he's very pissed. He's I'm, been very to be fair, his entire semester. Yeah. To be fair, the game. To be fair, kind of, kind of worth being mad about. Like he got, he got pranked real hard. <laughs> like, I mean, yeah, but it's, it's to the point that I legitimately thought for a little bit that he was gonna turn again during this part of the game. Oh. He was just so fucking like on edge. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's deserved because you're suddenly plotting to this alternate reality, but it's like even more so than any of the other party members, further you get them back. Uh, he's just he's so pissed and angry about this turn of events. <laughs> it's so weird. It's wild. Well, he does explain like the re one of the other reasons he's mad is like he made a decision for himself and now his decision was made null and void by something else right like he he chose to sacrifice himself so why why is he back right like yeah and that and that's the real question behind it like what what caused this to happen he's mad at whoever's doing this and so he's willing He's willing to work with Ren and, I well, in, inevitably the Phantom Thieves again to figure out what the fuck is going on, right? And, uh, I, I mean, can I, can I, can I skip ahead? We have been going for three and a half hours, yeah. so. I don't think so, we need to be detailed with this part. Yeah, so, essentially you find out that Maruki, the school counselor, uh, has... Assuming you ranked both his and Kasumi Yoshizawa's uh, social ranks all the way up, um, you you unlock this new chapter, right? So it's you find out that Maruki essentially had such a strong will to create an I an ideal society where reality doesn't matter it's about whatever you perceive as true happiness is real now and so everyone's yeah. everyone's on good vibe mode which you know sounds great but no one ever grows if they're just always given happiness right no one ever changes nothing life doesn't evolve if you're just given happiness yeah. all the time right and and so you know you find out like all the shit that went down with Kasumi, who, uh, this is like huge spoilers, because I, I think Kasumi is easily one of my favorite character arcs in the entire franchise, bar none. And y yeah, <laughs> like, so like, <laughs> real talk, if you've not played this game and you're still listening to this, please stop now, because you, I, I implore you to play it instead of listening to me describe this. So, anyway. Kasumi Yoshizawa, you, you know, throughout the game, you, you know, you hang out with her every now and then, right? But she's a bit of an odd one in that her confidant rank only goes up to five, right? And, yeah. uh, in, in this new arc, you sort of figure out why. Because you find out she's not Kasumi Yoshizawa, she is Sumire Yoshizawa, and Kasumi was her sister. Uh, a, her sister who she feels guilty for killing because she, like, essentially threw a fit and her sister ran after her and got hit by a car and yeah, died. Yeah, she pushed her out of the way. Right, pushed her out of the way, right. And all the immense guilt was weighing her down that soon after the accident uh Kasumi went to go see Maruki and Maruki intentionally or not like almost manipulated Sumire into believing that she's Kasumi and that she she's the star athlete right and that she 
she can live this happy life now. Like, that nothing bad ever happened, right? Um, yeah, and literally, it's literally like she swapped places with Kasumi. Correct. And it's, it's sort of like a really dark psychological thing, right? Like, yeah, she's happy now, but she's also not living in reality, you know? Like, she... She's not herself anymore. Right, she's not even who she's supposed to be as a person. Like, she... Like, it's... It's, it's like, a huge fucked up thing, right? And, like, there's nothing wrong with, like, wanting to change who you are, but, like, to be someone else is a different story, right? Um... And so, like, all of this ties back in to where Maruki is trying to create this ideal world where everyone's perfect and happy all the time. But the Phantom Thieves are like, no, dude, we can't be doing that. It's it's a weird connection to make, but, like, it gave me the same vibe as Sonic and the Black Knight because, uh, spoilers for that, spoilers for that game, uh, the, vil the villain of that game sort of does the same idea. It's, uh, they want an everlasting world. They want the world to continue and live on forever, so no one ever dies. No one has to deal with sadness. And Sonic, of all characters, is like, no, that you can't do that. Like, if, you know, we, we, have to, we have to make the most of our lives, and that is only something we can do if we have a time limit, you know? Like, living forever doesn't bring you happiness, right? Like, you need to achieve happiness on your own, right? Yeah. And, uh, lo long story short, you go through Mar Maruki's palace, which you've, you've gotten hints and teases at throughout the story, right? Um, and, uh, you get to the, you get to, actually, real quickly, what, what did you think of, uh, of Maruki's palace? Well, I think I mentioned to you, this to you before, but, uh. When we were early on in the palace, I was worried about the direction they would take with the palace and Maruki. Because I was specifically thinking, oh, are they going to go, like, after a point here it's revealed there was some, like, ulterior motive to everything he did? or some, like, really evil thing he's actually doing because of warping reality? And I was very relieved that, no, it's, it's really just that he, this is... His the story way of uh, ending Make, suffering. Making a, and, yeah, it's it's literally just like he feels overwhelming guilt about like what happened with his girlfriend, right? Like, yeah, he's if like Shido is the kind of villain where you you're just made to hate, whereas Maruki is the I sure don't even call him a villain or evil because he's not really he's just an antagonist for uh for it's you like, completely get where he's coming from yeah like, you sympathize with your opposition right yeah and it's it's hard to not see why people would want this utopia everyone is much happier in this place and he has a like obviously he's in the wrong but you understand his argument like no one has to suffer here no one has to go through any trauma the fantasies would not be necessary in this reality. Yep. And I, I really, I really loved Maruki's character. I loved that throughout the base game, you, uh, you build him up. I, at first, I thought it was just an average confidant <laughs> that was added, and that was all he was. But I love, uh, you know, you get bits of, uh, you help him with his research. And mm -hmm. this is what his research turned out to be. Right. And as a side note, I... This is, this is like a consequence of Ren being a mostly silent protagonist. I feel like they could have used this part to make him... If he was more of a character, have Ren feel really guilty about contributing to his research. And oh, yeah. It's kind of lead to all this. They, they could have done a great job, like, tying that all together, right? Like, they could have really yeah. emphasized the whole, like, connection that you have directly with Maruki, you know? Yeah, I was surprised that 
I think throughout the diary notes and the DVDs you find, he never mentions Ren or anything from the confidant, which is wild to me. Yeah, it's it's but. kind of upsetting, honestly, because like, it's it's moments like this where I appreciated. I'm I'm not going to get into any spoilers for that game, but in Persona 4 Golden, there's one dungeon in the game that isn't directly related to any of the characters that are in your party. So when they adapted it to the anime, they actually used that dungeon to develop Yu Narukami, the main character. And it's like actually it actually ties in really well with like what they were doing. So like I wish they kind of did the same thing with Royal and Ren, you know, in like in Maruki, right? So um. Yeah, and also it would also add to a catchy like finding out that Ren is part of the reason this all happened, like, that would just add to him being pissed off and having to very, very reluctantly work with him to stop it. Oh, yeah, definitely. But, uh... Hey. You were gonna say? Uh, and, and I, and I guess, uh... When, when all is said and done, right, you get... <clears throat> Maruki, like, consistently tries to tell you, like, I don't want to fight you, just let this happen, please. Like, you will be happier if you will allow this. And Ren's like, no, no, no. Phantom Thieves are like, no, no, no. Like, and then, <laughs> and so when it comes time, you know, Maruki shows up and he's like, this is your last chance, it's just me and you talking. Uh, well, Morgana, Ren, and Akechi are there. And Can Maruki we... is... Also, want to mention like so, if you max out a confidant with a party member, you get their their second awakening and their persona evolves. Yeah. If you go hang out with them on, again during this work reality, you'll get their third awakening where they're like, they're realizing like, they're rebellious again. Like we have to fight back and get back to our own reality. Yeah. And then their original persona and their new one morph together. It is so cool. Oh yeah, all the third third evolutions of the personas are super dope. Yeah. You it more or less goes back to the design of the original ones and then they get Diego and Maria. <laughs> 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 Western characters, which is so you get very simple names. But uh like <sighs> Baruki, I, I really love this character. I was worried they would make him may, uh, give you reason to actually like, hate him, but they don't. They just suffer on the su focus on his real motivation. I, I really liked it. Um, yeah. He's like... Honestly, I think I would call him a more interesting antagonist than Shido. Because, yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, because Shido, you're made to hate and hate and hate. Whereas Maruki, you get where he's coming from, and he is very emotionally poignant. And even, like, Samure, at first she falls back in line with him because it's just too much to handle all the pain. She doesn't want to. It hurts too much. Which is completely understandable. It's completely relatable to want to find something to hide and run away from the pain. Right. Before you realize you have to confront it. Um, and that's more or less what Mark he was doing the whole time. He was running from his own pain. Exactly. And it makes him much more sympathetic. And you really learn to like love like his whole arc and him as a character. Despite the fact he's your opposition, right? So. Yeah. Um, so, and his you know, fight is insane. <laughs> so, you know, Maruki gives you that final chance. He's like, hey, like, please don't do this. And, you know, Ren, the Phantom Thieves, and Akechi, and all of them are like, no, we are we need to stop this. And and so you hand him the calling card directly to him. You literally just hand it to him. And he's like, I'll be waiting then. And it, do, it does the fucking build up on the, the security meter, ranks it out. He's like, I don't... I'm gonna fight you on this. All right, you want this, and then it plays. I kid you not, the most hype fucking remix of Life Will Change. 
the song is called I Believe. And it's it's so li- good. It's so good. And I'm so sad that much like life will change, you don't get to hear a lot of it if you skip through the palace, you know? Like and Especially with Mar- because this pal this palace would be a pain in the ass to go through again. Especially well, with the puzzles and stuff. Cool. That's a, that's exactly why I didn't do it. What I did was I ran through most of it and then warped at the end. <laughs> like warped uh, through the end with the color, the fucking color puzzle at the end. Yeah, the second I got to like the save point before the color puzzle, I warped. I was like, I'm I'm good yeah. on that. <laughs> There's no way in hell I'm doing this again. Yeah, but I believe is such a great fucking song. I love that song to death. Um... And it, and it literally, if you read the lyrics to it, it literally is about, like, fighting for your beliefs. Like, I, I love it so much. But yeah. then, um, then you get to, uh, uh, the uh, Maruki fight, and you find out he has a fucking persona? Like, <laughs> and, like, you, and, like, the top of his facility, most of it is, like, a research facility, and the top of it is, is, like, paradise. This it's like a Garden of Eden shit. Else's... Yeah, this is where he sees everyone else as being in because of him. And this is like actual utopia. It's a like Garden of Eden that everyone is able to be in because of him warping reality. Uh, and what did you think of the uh, this this fight specifically? Uh... It was really cool having another, having like the actual final fight of the game, being a Persona user. So it was some like, in a way like on your level, you know, um, even if his Persona was a fucking Elgis horror. Uh, you're fighting. It was really cool because the way it worked out for us. We had like the perfect team going into it to take advantage of. The weaknesses of these tentacles and as a thought uh so it wasn't too bad you got into a rhythm and it was it was just really cool and then his personal uh he gets a, it gets a little stronger uh so you keep going you keep going <coughs> you beat him you try to escape the uh, by the palace with the treasure in hand but he mm-hmm. stops you. And he evolves the persona. Yes. <laughs> Which is insane. And, and what's and, what's and, cool is, uh, I explained this to you, honey, during the fight itself, but when he evolves Azathoth, his original persona, it becomes Adam Codman. And that's like really weird because it's just like a human name, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. uuh, But... I, I looked it up out of curiosity. Adam Cadman is, like, essentially Hebrew for, like, the, like, living essence of will. <laughs> like, so it, it literally means, like, strong human, basically. Like, it, re- it reflects Maruki's intense desire to make this happen, right? Like, it's so, yeah. it's such a cool little tie-in. But, yeah, I just wanted to bring that up. That's so good. And then you're, you're like, on a rooftop, fighting this gigantic being. Yeah, this, like, and... Ultraman-looking, fucking kaiju-fighting-looking, <laughs> like... And you can, you can get him down a little bit, I think, but nothing you're doing really matters. Yeah. Up until... You have to more or less survive until you get Futaba to find its weakness, mm-hmm. which is that as it's ro- uh, rearing its its attack to punch you, to punch the fantasy. This guy's just that big. Uh, everyone has to aim for its head. Uh, so you do that, you knock it out, uh, and then. Maruki goes into the persona. Oh yeah, he like basically fuses with it more or less. Yeah. And then uh they have to get it like knocked down. I forget what they do. Uh 
maybe that was when they had to aim, get from get to the head. Uh but anyway, like they get Joker on the head. It's so fucking hype and exciting. Joker just stands on the thing's head and shoots it. <laughs> and shoots straight through to Maruki. Breaking yep. the connection and it all comes crumbling down. Right. It's so fucking cool. <laughs> yeah, and then the whole ending sequence happens, right? Where, like, they try to escape and stuff like that. And the helicopter, like, the very silly looking ca like cat copter. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, uh. And then one last time, Maruki attempts to stop them, and he's got nothing left. The metaverse is dispersing, so neither of them can use their personas. So it's basically like a slap fight. <laughs> right. It reminds me of the spoilers for and sound X Spider Man. Uh after the real fight with Doc Ock at the end of that, you're like on the side of a building. There's not really much you can do, you're just kinda of slapping each other till the till story happens. It's basically yeah. like that. You yeah. just hit the attack button and it's endurance until uh, story happened. It's been scripted. Uh, so then it goes back into a cutscene uh, where you're like he's falling off and you're trying to save him, but he lets go. Mm -hmm. And from that point, he gets Joker gets back on the helicopter and he escapes, and reality returns to normal. Right. <sighs> it's it's a lot, right? <laughs> so yeah. What did you think of like that whole sequence? It was amazing. <laughs> it was maybe one of the biggest, one of the best endings of a game. And Marky, I would say, is one of my now one of my favorite video game protagonists. Honestly. Oh, wow, really? Yeah, uh... Because of just how, like, sympathetic he is, and you clearly understand his motives, and... Even with your teammates, it's like, you act actively have to decide if you're gonna... Agree to his version of reality, and... The utopia, or if you're going back to your own reality, where there's a lot of suffering and trauma. Mm hmm and it's like, he barely qualifies as a villain because he's not really evil in the slightest. He's just got this distorted sense of uh, saving people that's led to warping the entire fabric of reality. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's, it's so fucking good. Yeah. And then, uh... If I recall correctly, like, you know, everything goes back to normal and then time skips ahead a little bit, right? Um, and it's revealed that part of things going back to normal was when Joker. going back to the Joker going to the police. Yeah, Sam exactly. Puffin going to prison. Right, because it's revealed that Akechi showing up after uh, the depths of Mementos was part of Maruki's reality. So... Yeah, even that, like, it started, like, as the God of Control was wreaking havoc, as Mementos and the real world were mixing, that gave him, like, the perfect opportunity to start his reality. Yeah. And, uh, it's... So, J Ren goes to prison, right? And all of his confidants are... You know, they give you different scenes depending on who you maxed out, but everyone's fighting and fighting and fighting to get Ren free because, look, like, this was all, like, testimony, yeah, but he didn't do anything wrong, you know? Like, it was all Shido all the time, right? Like, Yeah, and they get all these people's uh, accounts to show how good a person Ren is. Mm -hmm. I love that sequence. That was so cool. Because that's something that's actively influenced by the player, you know? Like, it's such a cool yeah. scene. Because you rarely get, like... 
usually like in games and RPGs, you know, protagonist, protagonist, you're just, you're controlling the protagonist and you're the good guy because that's what the story dictates you are, right? Right. You're this good guy, you're scripted to do all these good things, it's whatever. And I love seeing this, like, it comes back to help you when you're in prison and everyone is grateful for what you've done for them, that they go out of their way to do as much as they possibly can to get you out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like, so he gets back out, right? And it like recreates that scene from the beginning of the game mm -hmm. where, where, uh, uh, so Jiro picks you back up and you're in traffic listening to things again on the radio, about right? train accidents. Yeah, about train accidents. <laughs> and uh, it's... Like Sojiro even points out, he's like, Shit's happening again? What's up? <laughs> like, <laughs> well, here we go again. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit, here we go again. <laughs> yeah, uh, and then that point, it's... Uh... You're really feeling the strong bond you have for Zojiro and all your party members, and a little after that, you go around the game world, uh, all different areas, talk to uh, everyone you've uh, you've made bonds with, and even hey. it's not just that. I love that even like the side characters from this conference. Right, uh, you get to meet like the track team and the guys who like messed with Mishima, like, it, it's literally everybody you met. Yeah. And, like, all their lives are better now. All their problems are resolved. It is so cool. Like, having the section of the game just dedicated to saying goodbye to all the characters. That you yeah. Met. Yeah, and it's such an awesome with. moment. Yeah. Yeah. And very sweet. <laughs> It's it is extremely sweet. It, it's bittersweet too because this is the end of your journey, you know. Like, yeah, like, it's not just like well, the everything's done. We get to just chill now. Everything, everyone is going separate ways. Mm -hmm. uh, Ryuji is going elsewhere. An's going elsewhere. Haru and Makoto are going elsewhere, and of course, Ren is leaving because his probation and ended. Yep. I, though honestly, for a bit, I was wondering if he would, like, like, uh, like, just stay. choose to stay in that area mm. because of all the friends he's built up in right. that area. They even, like, Ryuji but, even points out at one point, he's like, hey, dude, like, you're, you're gonna go back home, but, like, they don't know about all the shit you did. Like, they're not gonna know, like, that you're chill, right? Like, but, like, we're here for you, and, and Ren's like, I, I can't. Like, I I gotta keep pushing, you know? Like, I gotta go back. <laughs> yeah. Well, obviously he doesn't say that, because, you know, silent protagonists, and we can't write a character worth a fucking damn, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I will, I will imagine, know. imagine writing 400,000 lines of dialogue and not... More than ten of those are dedicated to the main character. <laughs> like... yeah. So, I was a little bit let down that they didn't make the decision to have him just stay and have that, uh, that happiness of him hanging out with his friends and all the people he's made connections with and, like, yeah, this is my new home now, that kind of thing. But I get the theme was I got a strive i gotta evolve i gotta grow mm -hmm. just like everyone else was so he went back to his real home yeah and uh you know it, it's interesting that like when you're going around saying goodbye to all your your confidants and the the friends in those confidants right uh you don't get to say goodbye to samire and then you know when you're yeah. when you finally get to the train station uh, to travel back home, right? Uh, you you bump into her, and she's like, "Hey, you know, see you around." Like she's very nonchalant yeah. about it, right? She's, but you know, you see her in her training gear, meaning that she not only accepted like life and what 
came like what happened right but she's still pushing herself to be the best she can at you know gymnastics right like it's it's such a subtle character thing they don't need like a big wrap up for her you got her whole story and her arc you just need to know like here's a small subtle hint you know where she is now you know yeah and then Ren gets on the train and you know Morgana's with him now like permanently you know so he has someone around right and well, before he gets on the train he gets in that taxi with I, uh Mark yeah with Marky and uh Mar- Marky you know es- essentially is saying like don't don't regret your life choices if this is the life you chose you know like I- I figured they'd bump into Marky again, but I kind of wish his scene was a little longer to more reflect on, like, his changed heart. But, yeah, you know, it was a wrap-up, so... Right. And, and you know, I think, I think it's powerful enough to just leave it at, you know, hey, you know, you fought for the world to be like this, so, you know, really show that this is good, you know? Like, really... Yeah, and he's like... Like what I'm doing being a taxi driver. Um, <sighs> it's never too late to restart everything and uh, change who you want to be. Right. It's it's a powerful message and, and it's a, a really good way to wrap it up. But I, I do agree. I do wish it was just a, a smith, like another couple sentences or something like to wrap it up. But like that, like that it, was like a pretty I, good moment. I would have like, you know, like a dedicated like conversation there, yeah. but like it worked the way it was. Yeah. Uh, and then and then you meet Tamiri, and then you get on the train, uh, and you know when you get on the train, uh, if it, it starts rolling credits at that point, you know, um, and you know you're you're sitting there listening to I believe the song is called uh, Our Light. And it's a very beautiful piece. Love that piece. It's, it's, uh, I wouldn't put it in my like top five Persona 5 songs because like I, I'm a hype man. So I got, I got to put the high energy songs at top. But like, Our Light is a really good piece and like a perfect, like, you know, just cherry on top of the Sunday, you know, like, uh, you know, and you're watching the credits roll by and then, at the very end, you get you get one of those Marvel MCU after credits, <laughs> <laughs> where you know, Ren's you know, on 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 the train now, and he looks out the window, and for a brief moment, you see someone with a very familiar brown coat and black gloves walk by, and it's like, oh, how is he still alive? <laughs> like, what happened? Like. And I feel, I feel like if you got the third semester, that surprise is hindered a little bit because you already had that surprise in a way, you know. But right. It's so really cool to see in the in your real realm that he is still alive. Right, but that's the thing: you don't get an answer of how. Yeah. I so, hope that was answered in Strikers. <laughs> no, Strikers doesn't have any story elements from Royal. Wait, but doesn't Akechi, like, still live in the base reality? Isn't that still a normal thing? No. Or is it... Oh, okay. That's exclusive to Royal. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. His yeah. confidant, like I said, his confidant is originally maxed out just by playing the game in vanilla. But in Royal, if you have to max it out to get this scene. But yeah, like you get, you see Akechi still alive and you're like, wait, but we're not in a dream reality anymore, right? But then there's like a brief moment where Joker is looking at the glass and you see him change into a, his, in the reflection, into his Phantom Thief gear. And then he, he like shakes his head and it's back to normal again. But then when he shuts the window, like the blinds on the window, the f- fin, it's the end. <laughs> you you don't it, it hints that maybe there's something else coming for the Phantom Thieves and you know we did get more with 
Strikers, but there's no sequel to Royal. <laughs> Which really, it's a major bummer. And again, I, I firmly believe the reason for that is that Atlas didn't want to give Koei Tecmo uh, story details. <laughs> they, they probably didn't want to leak that out. Look, Atlas USA can't even get the scripts on time to translate these games. <laughs> like, we're, we're not... Like, uh, Koei Tecmo was not going to get the script to write a story around Royal stuff, you know? Um, it just sucks, like, they had to add that little, like, bay at the end, and then there's no follow-up in Strikers. Right, yeah. The, probably in anything, but... You, n you never know. We have the anniversary. We could be getting something else, you know? Uh, Persona 5 2.5. Oh, jeez, please, no. <laughs> uh, no, wait, we're going to get Persona 5 2, and it's going to be a sequel to the vanilla game, and then we're going to get Persona 5 2 Royal, and that's going to be a sequel to Royal. <laughs> no, it'll just be Persona 5 Strikers Royal. Oh, God, no. Look, I like, I, I like Strikers a lot, but <laughs> I don't want that again, please. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that, that's, that's it. So, you know, what, what did you think of everything at this point, I guess, is more or less it, like... There were some elements we didn't really touch on, but... Oh yeah, there's a ton of, just, just, yeah, like, just, we just to we quickly... We didn't talk about the Velvet Room at all, but... Right, we didn't talk about the Velvet Room, we didn't talk about most of the confidants, like, we... We left a lot of stuff for, like, anyone who's listening and is like, oh, I don't care about spoilers. There's plenty of content left to talk about. Like, that yeah. for you to experience yourself. We usually could have gone for another hour or two. Oh, yeah, We wanted totally. to go more into every single confident or just, like, again, we didn't talk about the Velvet Room barely at all. Uh, I was going to mention small things about romance not being greatly executed in 5. Uh, hand holding me a bit much, <laughs> especially at the start. Like they act really dumb. Yeah. Uh, localization is a bit wonky in a place where they mention English. I don't. It wasn't a problem in Persona Three. I don't know why it became a problem later. <laughs> and then uh, we have. I have to mention this live, so it's. That's what it's recorded. Uh, <laughs> that moment, we were doing a fusion during an alarm, and it was an accident, and we got the most OP black ooze ever to break the frame. <laughs> <laughs> I totally forgot about that, but you're right. We <laughs> we we created the most fucking hype, like slime or black ooze or whatever the fuck. Like, for it was like really shitty stat wise, but like all his yeah, spells like, were like, like complete top tier. Like, it was like level 20 or whatever, like really low, so it was not useful. But his skills were really fucking good, and we will not get those skills for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so that was just that made both of us laugh our asses off. <laughs> It's so good. Oh god, I found it. Yeah, it was a slime. So yeah, we oh, got a slime. Picture. Yeah, I found the picture. It's on your Twitter. Um, yeah. I knew I knew it was on your Twitter. Uh, okay, so boom, there's the picture for you, sweetie. Uh, there we got we got a slime with tier three magic that <laughs> and like <laughs> and like. But his stats are like 11 strength, 7 magic. <laughs> like, he's level 10. He sucks. Yeah, he is a tier 3 uh, fire and uh, single multi-target. Tier 3 uh, uh, wind. I think it's, that's tier 2 multi-target uh, wind. Uh, mm -hmm. Plus the burn boost. Uh, he would have been fucking broken if he was the appropriate level. Yeah. God, just what a what a fucking god tier slime. Yeah.
but you know, overall, what'd you yeah. what'd you what'd you think? Persona Five Royal is easily now one of my favorite games of all time. Top five, maybe top three if I thought about it and compare it to the other games up there. Uh, soundtrack is phenomenal. One of the best there is. Uh, even if I don't super love the individual party members on their own, I really love their camaraderie and how tightly knit that group is as close friends. Mm -hmm. uh, the story pacing is ass. But when you, get, <laughs> when, you get, when you get to the heart of it, it's really good. And I love the mysteries and how it's finally resolved. Uh, the gameplay is super, super solid. The, such a satisfying loop of leveling up the social stats and the confidants. That all leads back into palace gameplay. The metaverse, and that's super fun. Mm. Uh, and Shido is so satisfying to take down. And then Maruki is one of the the best antagonist I've ever seen. Ah, uh, for a reason I've already said. It's, just, <laughs> it's, it's such a phenomenal game. I'm already like, a little part of me is already like wanting to replay the game. Even though I do not have the time to do that in the slightest. What do you mean uh, you definitely do? What do you mean? I do not in the slightest. <laughs> what? No, no I, I, th I think you do, babe. I think you do have time. Also, I can mention my total playtime was like 192 hours. Oh, yeah. So we should mention like generally a playthrough for most people will take about 120, but we did most of the side stuff, right? So. Yeah. And idle times by checking guides and whatnot. Yeah, checking uh, guides and all that. Yeah, like literally <laughs> the only cop on sweet. What's that? A skull kid tiger in the chat putting my P5 R mask on now. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. He's getting hype. <laughs> like really the only cop runs we didn't do were the Torch Tower and Lavenza, which Lavenza apparently spoiled uh Lavenza. Oh yeah, I... that's why that's specifically why I didn't want you to do it, is because if you do the twins confidant, it straight up just like tells you that they are like split apart one person. Like it's it's really stupid it how cool badly it, it gets like, spoiled. It would be cool if it like maybe implied it, but apparently it just straight up spoils it, which is awful. It they they literally like wink wink nudge nudge you into like what it is. And it's like not cool, dude. <laughs> Uh, and the only other one was the fortune teller, which I, I literally looked up the abilities list you get from her, and they're all completely worthless. <laughs> it's all temporary stuff. Like, yeah. why would you ever do that? Yeah. Like, the, like, oh yeah, aren't great either, but at least they're tangible things. Mm -hmm. Like, messing with the security level, it's not really useful at all, but whatever. It's at least just a permanent thing. <laughs> right, right. Uh, we did most of the compliments, we did most of the, like, the books, and I did, like, every book except one. Uh, I did all the games, I did a good chunk of the DVDs. Uh, yeah, I did, I think I did, like, all but one or two Mementos targets, apparently. Mm -hmm. Um, there was, like, some kind of ch battle challenging the Velvet Room, which I didn't touch at all. Uh, apparently all you get from that is skill cards? Uh, uh, yeah, like skill cards and I think an achievement maybe, and that's it. I don't even know yeah. if an achievement is the thing you get. I'm not sure, but... I, actually, I want to say no, because I think I have most of the trophies and none of it involved <laughs> the battle mode, so... Yeah, that's definitely something I would have tried was playing on my own, but there was no need to. Um, yeah. Otherwise, yeah, it was it was like a 95, 98% playthrough, pretty much. 
Yeah, it, it was. You did most, of the, if not all, the stuff basically. So. <laughs> yeah. And that's about everything that we can say without going for another hour. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Well. Well, honey, I'm I'm glad you had a wonderful time with Persona Five Royal. I had a wonderful time playing with you. Uh, now we'll I just need to. Be... I'll just need to convince we'll you to go... play Persona Four Golden next. So. God, no, that won't be the next Persona next. game I'm playing. I'm, I will play next. Strikers first. Next. It will be Strikers. Next up. A lot more than Phantom Thieves. Next up is Fuck Persona. You. Four... <laughs> is is Persona Four Persona Golden? Persona 4 Golden, which is a game that has a sequel, unlike Persona 5 Royal. So, just let... All right now. <laughs> <laughs> just, just letting you know, everyone, that Persona 4 Golden is going to be the game that she plays next. And she has, I would say, probably 0% say in whether or not she plays that. It, it, definitely zero. Definitely doesn't doesn't want to play Strikers. Bad game. Zero out of ten. I'm just kidding. Sorry. Strikers is pretty Sorry. great. There's so many falsehoods being saying being said about me right now. I can't. <laughs> anyway, thank thank you, honey, for joining me on this almost four and a half hour discussion. So God, but are, are we plan to do it for like three and a half at a maximum. But there was just so much to say. Yeah, exactly. Even cutting out a lot. It's like, right. God. Like, we cut a ton of it out, but even then, we still yeah. filled four hours. Now you see why... I told you this on uh, on Discord, but uh, I, I mentioned that <laughs> me and, my, and two of my friends, when the vanilla game came out, we had, like, <laughs> several hours of discussion, and you're like, how did you do that? And I'm like, trust me. We can do that. <laughs> like, it was oh, a lot of talking. I can see us going for like one, maybe two or two and a half hours more. Going through like every confidant. I can't see ten hours. I just can't. But um, but that's also three people. Yeah, that's true. Uh, <laughs> Skull Kid Tiger, glad I was here and hope to play a Persona game, period. Okay, I have... Per P P oh, P that's right. Okay, so if you play it on PS5, by the way, you get 4K 30 FPS. So play it on fucking PS5. That game is beautiful. <laughs> so I'm really bummed I played it on PS4. <laughs> but oh well. <laughs> I mean, you could play Strikers on PS5. And I will. I already have a download on there. <laughs> well, on there. I bought it. <laughs> it's not. I don't think it sent me download and install but it, i bought it there you go i have a yep. uh, ps4 version gonna come out i play oh hell yeah yeah let's go let's go <laughs> all right but anyway thank you everyone who watched uh, i i noticed there were like lurkers and stuff so i appreciate all of you for watching i appreciate you skull Kid tiger for hanging in here and i appreciate you jess for not only playing one of my favorite series of all time <laughs> but just being who you are. I love you, sweetheart. Anyway, have a good night, everyone. <laughs>